From the Southeast Asian capital city of the Philippines, Manila, I bid you good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be in the world's time zones, and boy, we've got a lot of them. I'm in one of the more obscure ones here. It's uh, it's now, we, we don't switch times, by the way, here in the Philippines. Sanity prevails in the Philippines. So it is now not 1 o'clock in the afternoon, as I would normally be doing the program, but 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And that's because all of you switched something that, uh, something I've been campaigning against now for for years, maybe all my life. I've always wondered why we switch times. The reasons are kind of obscure. I think they go back to the farming days in America. And uh, I don't really think that the corporate, the big corporate farms with their giant machinery and all the rest of it really care what time it is. But what do I know? Anyway, all the ABs are just fine. As a matter of fact, if you uh, take a look at the website, you'll see a picture of Asia, little Asia, who is now just talking up a storm. Uh, That was taken on Halloween here. And she became a little angel, um, officially. Has little wings there. You can see them. And she's growing quite quickly. She's now uh, nearly two and a half years old. And uh, she's really something. Really, really something. Otherwise, otherwise, uh, there's not been a lot going on. I just bought, I had a laptop collapse on me. It just, you know, went belly up. And so I had to go buy a new laptop. Now, this this is going to be an experience that a lot of you are going to have in the fairly near future. Uh, you're going to get a new computer of one sort or another. And let me tell you, it, it comes with Windows 7. Now, I've stuck, I never went to Vista, and I stuck with uh, XP. Uh, so taking the jump from XP to Windows 7 is really, really traumatic. And I, I don't have a bad word to say about Windows 7. It's simply... So utterly and completely different that um, I don't know. I you'll you'll see what I mean when it happens to you. Eventually, it will occur to you. You will uh, you lose a computer. They don't live forever. Uh, nothing lives forever, us included. And they eventually die. And then you'll have to go out and you'll have to buy you have to buy a new one. Well. Prepare yourself because even though Windows Seven is a very intelligent, interesting. And I'm sure ultimately a superior operating system, it is going to cause great mental strain for you, (laughs) as it is me. Although I've I've got it about 90% there, but it's been a several-day project. And uh, so, you know, you're trying to transfer things and get things in the computer, and oh, boy, is it something. Windows 7. Um, Beyond that, uh, that's occupied a lot of my time lately, learning a completely new operating system. Um, Other than that, I still don't have my antenna up. We're waiting for the typhoons to relent. Uh, We are in the middle of a kind of a a respite, but we're expecting two or three more before the season ends. And it's been a long season, folks, a very, very, very long season. Looking briefly at the world news, I see that uh, the big health care vote is about to happen, suitably opaque section 2006 takes up only a few dozen lines in a sweeping health care bill, but 2,074 pages of a health care bill. Senator Mary uh, Landrieu, I believe it is, nor her state of Louisiana, uh, may not know a whole lot about it. Well, I guess she does, but it's due to deliver $100 million, $100 million in federal funds to her state. And in the process, uh, clear the way for one of three moderate Democrats, fence sitters, uh, to put their vote in what's considered to be the right place. So we'll, we'll have to see what happens. It's going to be the big vote on Saturday. Now, let's see. They're discovering more letters from Hassan. And uh, we don't know yet uh, what the content of those letters is, uh, but, but there were certainly contacts. It, it, it's always you find out these things much later, don't you? Well, gee, we should have known. He was doing this, he was doing that, he was talking to this person and that person, and we really should have known, but we never do, do we? 
The Justice Department intends to drop manslaughter and weapons charges against one of the Blackwater Worldwide Security Guards, remember, involved in the deadly 2007 Baghdad shooting. Uh, That caused uh, the Blackwater contract to be terminated, and I suppose many to join the unemployment line. Republicans are seizing on this week's recommendations. What a mess this has been for fewer pap smears and mammograms. It's dominated the news. By the way, I do get the news here. I get, of course, CNN. I get Fox. I get uh, all of the the big news uh, organizations here. In fact, I watch NBC Nightly News one day late. And the whole mammogram thing has really been dominating the news to have or not to have a mammogram, and it all winds into the president's proposed health care plans. California is in, uh, investigating several companies suspected of bilking churches. Can you imagine that nationwide of hundreds of thousands of dollars through fraudulent computer leasing schemes? I wonder if it was Windows 7. Uh, State Attorney General Jerry Brown said as many as 30 Southern California churches may have been defrauded along with uh, the same companies suspected of bilking other churches in as many as 10 other states. Wow. And this is very, very interesting. A couple of items are very interesting. One is the Big Bang machine, the Big Collider. Scientists switched on the world's largest atom smasher Friday night for the very first time since the $10 billion machine suffered a spectacular failure. That was about a year ago. It took one year of repairs before beams of protons finally went happily circulating around late Friday in the Large Hadron Collider for the first time since it was heavily damaged by nothing more than a simple electrical fault. Now, as you know, it's going to be so interesting to see what happens with this because... Uh, there are those who believe that the the uh, large collider is actually being sabotaged from the future. In other words, it could be the end of all mankind. There are a few who believe that. You never know. Making black holes? You never know, right? So some people believe that. And we'll have to see. This is only the beginning. They've, they've got it working apparently again in in some fashion. And I don't know when they plan to try to make a black hole, but I assume they'll take it slowly. And I'm sure that something like a large bird will fly in and destroy the whole thing. And if that happens, that's going to give a lot of weight to that uh, sabotage from the future thing. And then this, a Vatican researcher has rekindled the age-old debate over the Shroud of Turin, saying that faint writing on the linen is now proving that it was indeed the burial cloth of Jesus. Experts say the historian may be reading too much into the markings, and they stand by carbon dating that points to the shroud being a medieval forgery. But Barbara Frail, a researcher at the Vatican Archive, says, listen carefully now in a new book that She used computer-enhanced images of the shroud to decipher family, uh, rather faintly written words in, get this, Greek, Latin, and Aramaic, scattered all across the cloth. So maybe it is real Aramaic, huh? That's kind of how the world looks at the moment, until they really get that uh, large had run a collider uh, going and create the first black hole, and then who knows if we'll have a world. <laughs> All right. Uh, following a break, we're going to uh, we're going to have a very interesting program, Starfire Tour. I've never interviewed her. I know George has. But her subject is time. And I'm absolutely fascinated with time. Always have been, always will be. Starfire Tour is going to talk about uh, uh, time in, in several different respects. And Whitley Strieber will join us 30 minutes or so into the show. Starfire Tour is a respected PSI researcher, scholar, author, and experiencer. I mean, she's part of this, who discovered 
the unified field theory of PSI. That alone is interesting. Time shifts, the core matrix, and has developed applied reality shift PSI science, including reality shift manifestation. These are going to all require definitions for us, uh, explanations. Starfire Tour has published many research reports and investigations was the head science writer for Quest magazine, wow, and a one, at one time was a chief brain at a private think tank, Starfire. Starfire Tour is currently working on her innovative interactive television series, Earth Quirks, which incorporates her cutting-edge research and discoveries. She has vast knowledge. She's published works, lectures, interviews, field investigations, Internet presence, Starfire Tour, is also writing her first how-to book, Reality Shift Manifestation, which is based on the manifestation protocols she developed over years of research. So this is going to be, one way or the other, a very, very interesting program. And again, we'll be joined by Whitley Strieber at some point. With all that in mind, we'll take a quick break and we'll get underway. (laughs) It's very interesting. Um, just before we bring on Star Starfire, uh, Jeremy, I'm give his last name, and uh, Telavar Iraq is listening to me right now. And I guess I ignore the fact that uh, you know we're on around the world. So he listens. Uh, he says, he's, "Hi, Art. Welcome back. I'm a soldier in Iraq who listens to Coast to Coast AM from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. So there you go." It really is all around the world. I've been listening uh, since you were the regular host in the late 90s. Wish I could hear you more often. Take care, buddy, Jeremy. So there you go. All the way on the other side of the world in Iraq. Be safe, Jeremy. All right. Starfire Tour, welcome to Coast to Coast AM. I should say welcome back. Hello, Art. Nice to meet you. Uh, It's nice to meet you. And... um, I didn't have the luxury of hearing your first program uh, with George, but time, uh, Starfire is my, is it okay to start you, can I say Starfire or should I call you Starfire Tor? The first name is fine, Starfire. Okay, okay. It's an intriguing first name. Is this, is it your real given name or did you sort of uh, rename yourself at some point? It's a nickname and Americanization of my actual name, which is Astrid. Really? Okay. Mm-hmm. Astrid. Kind, kind, yeah, kind of exotic anyway. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Um, before we get into the, you know, we've got a bunch of questions that uh, I guess you sent along. Uh, time, Starfire, has always been just, I don't know, I guess a central fascination for me. And I'm wondering, honestly... Uh, what you know or think you know, um, (laughs) nobody really knows, about the nature of time itself. With all you've done, you must have come to some conclusions about the nature of time, what it's all about. Oh, I have. You know, when I actually made my discoveries of time shifts and coexisting timelines and time slips, I wasn't looking to solve the mystery of time. I was actually trying to solve the mystery of paranormal events and other anomalies and enigmas that happen on the planet. And it's my research that actually brought me to the moment when I had that eureka moment in research where I tripped across um, what I've now discovered. And in that, I discovered the source and nature of time itself and the fact that We don't actually live in a singular timeline that is in the now and has a past and has a forward, but we are actually involved in many coexisting timelines, each slightly just a little bit altered from the next. And they are separated not as parallel timelines because there's really no such thing. It's actually altered by frequencies, very much the way that uh, your radio show, if it's going out as a broadcast medium, uh, you have all of these radio stations and you tune in the station that you want and that's Mm -hmm. what you'll hear. But it doesn't mean that every other broadcasting radio station in the world has suddenly stopped functioning. No, it's still there. 
and it's not in a parallel world. It's just slightly altered by frequency. So these coexisting timelines function very much the same way. Theoretical physicists now are talking about as many as 11 separate dimensions. Um, do you Are you in agreement with that? That thought uh, are are there different dimensions as such? Well, I'm I'm always happy any time that the quantum researchers uh, step into the fray and begin to talk about uh, that there are more than one timeline, uh, whether they call it timelines or dimensions or multiple worlds. Right now, anyone who would be calling it 11 dimensions, I'm just going to sit back and let them work through their own research because they have a ways to go if that's where they're at. But I applaud them for stepping out and bringing it into the public just as I have. Okay. You said you discovered the source and nature of time itself. Um The way I understand things, before there was anything, before there was a Big Bang star fire, there was nothing, essentially a great empty vacuum, and then there was the Big Bang. As soon as you had the Big Bang, then you had two objects, uh, and a lot more than two objects, but as soon as you have at least two, then you have a movement of two objects that, that you can measure, and once you can begin to measure, then you can begin to measure time. So time must have begun, I guess, when the Big Bang began uh, with no objects, no movement. There could be no measure, so there could be no time. Does that seem logical to you? You said you, you discovered the source and right. nature of time. Um, actually, there are two distinct uh, ways that the brain understands the creation of everything, as you were discussing, and the Big Bang theory, and that actually works. However, there is another layer, a a deeper one. You see, we are actually in a biological, what I call a core matrix. And that core matrix functions as a computer's hard drive, except this hard drive, the core matrix, is life. It's not just a machine. And everything that we experience in our consciousness happens because there is a program running in this core matrix. And part of that program which spawns the universe, the world, and everything we see has its own physics. But the deeper physics is actually sourced through the core matrix. And um, what I do is I find a way to blend both worlds without um, interloping one into the other. So the Big Bang exists. All of quantum physics exists. But you have to know about the core matrix because if you don't, you're not going to understand the actual true nature of how the world works. And that includes uh, the paranormal, anomalies, ghosts, hauntings, time travel, um, the way that our world seems to slightly alter from time to time, odd things like that. All of these phenomena are explained from my research and my discoveries. And it's Brad, really, Brad, you know, Brad's time, sorry, Brad Steiger, there's a slight delay between this side of the world and that, so it causes us to collide, collide every now and then. Brad Steiger and I wrote a book um, called The Source, and it, um, I, I don't know if you ever had a chance to peruse, peruse it, but uh, the basic tenet is that everything you described, all of these um, phenomena, are sourced in roughly the same place. Um, it, it all comes from the same place. And I take it, though you may not, we may not agree on the place, that you feel the same way. Um, all I can say, because I have, I have to research it from the position of being in this human body using this human brain. Sure. So I can only see it from that filter. I'm sure that if I was something else, I might see a different picture, a larger tapestry. So right now, when when I look at the core matrix, I recognize that there may be more than one core matrixes, that they themselves may be like the galaxies that we see, you know, how there's um, um, a micro and a macro world awareness. So 
even though the human brain likes to think of one singular beginning, my intellect tells me that there's always something more. One quick question, because we're on a break. Was all of this created? Oh, yes. Ah, yes, all created. All right. Well, that's what I wanted to know. My guest is uh, Starfire Tour, and we're talking about several. Actually, we're talking about almost all of the paranormal. But we're, talking, we're going to talk about specifically time shifts and some weird things that do occur with time. And they really do occur. I'm sure many of you have had these experiences. So Starfire Tour, Whitley Streber, I'm Art Bell for George Norrie, and we'll be right back. You are indeed all the way from the Philippines in Southeast Asia. Great to be here. Hop, skip, and a jump from uh, Bangkok or Hong Kong. It's all about an hour, hour and a half uh, plane flight away. So that's where we are. And it is never, ever, I guess, normal for me to feel that I can sit here in Southeast Asia and speak to all of you around the world, all across the world, from so far away. It's just amazing. I don't think that anybody has ever, ever done a long-form talk show. I mean, uh, I've got a lot of uh, a lot of admiration for Premier Radio uh, to be able to have the guts to even try this. It's just astounding. All right, my guest is Starfire Tour, and we're talking about time. We'll be joined shortly by Whitley Strieber, but this has been a fascination all my life. We may not really know about the nature of time, the true nature of time, until we get that unified field theory that uh, Einstein was working so hard on. That may be the moment, or there may never be a moment, uh, until we meet our creator. Then we may know. We'll be right back. I'd like to remind everybody that you can uh, email me. I'd love to get emails, and I answer as many as I'm able to. I'm Art Bell, A-R-T-B-L-L at MindSpring.com. Art Bell at MindSpring.com. Now, Joe in, uh, I believe it's Centertown, Kentucky, is being critical and says, she says that the different timelines are separated by, in quotes, frequency. Frequency, says Joe, requires something to be vibrating. What's vibrating? How does one measure the frequency? Requires some real measurable physics. Otherwise, it's not science. Well, I'm not sure that she claims that it is. Certainly, she doesn't claim to be a physicist. Just to have discovered some oddities in time, uh, Joe. And uh, by the way, with regard to your comment on frequency, what about strings, Joe? I'm sure you've had uh, an opportunity to listen to Michio Kaku, Dr. Kaku, who talks frequently about other dimensions, which is why I mentioned them, and string theory, of which he was uh, uh, a co-author of the discovery of string theory, and that is, that would be the theory of vibrating strings. Yes? All right, Starfire, welcome back. Thank you. Um, it, it, we're going to bring Whitley on shortly, but before we do, I you know, I want to get an idea of what you consider a time shift to be? Um, A time shift occurs when uh, the conscious world around you, the everyday reality that you are used to, suddenly alters. Something in it alters. Um, One of the more recognizable time shifts is when someone is very aware of time because they've looked at their watch and they walk into a building to a meeting, let's say, at 2 p.m. Uh, they're in the meeting for about an hour, and as they're leaving, it's suddenly 11 a.m. 11 a.m. Time has shifted. Why? They don't know. Um, suddenly they find that the meeting was always for 10 a.m., but they have an actual memory marker that the meeting was for 2, they were there at 2, and suddenly there's been this change. And they don't know what to make of it. This happens to people all the time when time shifts. What has actually happened is the entire timeline has been altered. And I always talk about it in terms of computers and also frequencies because that's the best way for me to communicate in a way that most people can understand. Obviously, it's a much deeper, more complex science than that. So... 
this is the type of anomaly that not only was I researching, but that I've experienced on a number of occasions. Was it just the locale where uh, time was shifting? And then uh, I began to write articles, including Quest magazine, about people who had experienced uh, driving up and down the street where they live, where they've driven up and down thousands of times, and all of a sudden, right there, just a couple of houses away, is a whole completely other home. It's not the house that was there when they went away for lunch and they come back and there's completely other building. Now, everyone in the neighborhood says, what are you talking about? That's the house that's always been there. But this person has a memory marker, and they're not crazy, that says, no, there has been a change. Someone can have a favorite shirt, and it might be yellow in color, and they hang it up. And the next day they pull it out, and it's blue. And it's not because it went through the wash and came out wrong. No. Something has altered. These literally happen with absolutely no scientific reasoning. In fact, no scientist, except myself, ever really tackled these anomalies. And this is what I mean by a time shift. That's the simplest way that people actually experience them. Okay. Uh, I, I know what you're saying mm -hmm. uh, because it's occurred to me, and I think it's occurred to most people. I, how are you able to be even reasonably sure that, uh, that it's not some sort of just mental aberration. Certainly in some cases it, it, it is, sure. uh, but right. it's kind of uh, like, it's kind of like ufology, you know, uh, how, how can you be sure of what you've seen? Uh, how can, how can you be sure it wasn't, uh, something that your mind is, you know, putting in front of you and you think you see it, but you don't really, uh, how do we differentiate between uh, a mental slip and a real time slip? Right. Well, when I first began this research, of course, everything that I was pursuing was anecdotal. Um, so the first phenomenon that I'm faced with is this is an incredible human experience. If this is a mental illness, then, uh, wow, it's not even being addressed by psychiatrists or psychiatry at all. It's like what Dr. John Mack used to say about alien abduction phenomenon if this isn't actually happening, then it is one of the greatest unspoken of psychiatric conditions, which is global and historical. Well, I was faced with the same um, problem with this until I actually got documented evidence, actual, physical, documented evidence, which I have to this day. And all right. Once I got uh, before, all right. Before we move to actual physical documented evidence, okay. which I would love, um, how did you discover the phenomena yourself? I In other words, some, something myself. happened to you, right? Um, ever since I was a child, I would um, see that uh, there were slight uh, changes in the way a piece of, uh, say, a couch was. A different fabric was now on the couch, and I'd, I'd ask my mom or dad, and you know, did you change it while I was at school? And they look at me sort of crazy and say no. But I myself, and I'm, I'm very psychic, and I would have dreams where I would see uh, what turned out to be events that would happen in a few days. Um, uh, I would see objects appear and disappear. These are called apports. Um, I had the whole gamut of paranormal events happening to me, but I was also considered a, a prodigy. Um, I was in advanced um, studies. I was very intelligent, and no one was calling me crazy, yet nobody could tell me why was this happening. And thus began, from my own personal experiences, my journey. Okay. All right. Um, if Whitley Strieber is here, bring him forth. Uh, Whitley, if you're there, hey, buddy. I am here, indeed, Art. It's good to talk to you and good to be on again with you after quite a while, actually, since we've crossed paths on the air. It certainly has been. We talk on the phone every now and then. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, it's been a while on the air. Now, I, I, I didn't know you were involved um, with Starfire at all, uh, in, actually until yesterday. That's how out of the loop I guess I am. But... <laughs> You, uh, you've you actually had experience uh, in the, in this area, right? Well, I'm going to, yes. 
least I have. And the interesting thing about knowing Starfire is this, that before we knew her, Anne and I had never been conscious of anything like this. If they had these experiences, and a little while later, I'm going to tell you a doozy. They, they happen actually probably a lot. Starfire could tell you how often. But once you're around her and she's, you listen to her explaining this stuff, you begin to notice them. And we've had, we had a couple that I talked about with George the other night. And uh, one I didn't mention to him happened uh, right at the same period, right after we had met Starfire and really gotten into this a little bit and gotten to thinking about it. And that was we were walking home, and uh, it was a perfectly normal afternoon. And we knew where we were. There was no secret. We were crossing the street. Uh, we were about three blocks from home. And we were in the middle of the street. I just looked up and down the street. And then suddenly we were in front of our building, in front of our condo, with absolutely no – it was just astonishing. Uh, it, in, other, in other words, you were just suddenly – there. I mean, there was no feeling of movement. There was nothing unusual about it. And I looked at Anne and I said, where are we? She said, we're home. I said, we can't be home. We're two blocks away. And uh, we're, we're just we're, here's what I guess I want to ask you. There was nothing here's else what, we could do. Right. Here's what I want to ask you. Is it possible that you and Anne were involved in uh, a significant, deep conversation about something Absolutely or another? Not. We weren't yeah. at all. In fact, we were walking home from the farmer's market with uh, some uh, some food we'd bought. And we weren't in any kind of a deep conversation. It was a Saturday morning at about 11. Maybe maybe a little, maybe it was in the early afternoon, actually. More like about 1. I think it was because the farmer's market had just been closing before we left. And it closes at 1, so it was early afternoon. And no, we weren't in any kind of a deep, in fact, we weren't even talking. We had... I had looked both ways because we were crossing a street that had stop signs only on one side. The street we were, the part we were on had stop signs, but the street we were crossing had none. And so I was being very careful so that, you know, we wouldn't have a car come speeding down while we were crossing the street. Of course, of course yeah. It was it. Um, so any, so no, you were just suddenly there with, yeah. with no explanation of where no that explanation time went. Did you, did you look down? Did you look down? Right, that was the explanation. That's what we finally decided. Yeah. Did you look down uh, to see how much actual time had passed? Uh, no, I couldn't because I hadn't been looking at my watch. In other words, okay. I couldn't, if I had glanced at my watch be right before, yeah, that would have been valid. But since I hadn't looked at my watch at all, I did certainly look at the time, and it seemed it seemed like we'd been – it takes about a half hour to walk from the farmer's market. And I think we came to the conclusion that we'd been uh, walking for about 12 minutes approximately. We were just estimating maybe 15 at most, but certainly not more than 15 or 20. We were at least 10 minutes uh, – at least we it, it was we gotten there at least ten minutes faster than we should have, and probably more actually. Whew. Um, I would be willing to bet that if we opened the phone lines, which we'll do much later, but if we did and uh, began to seek people who have had this experience, the phone lines would lock up. It would be total gridlock because this is a, actually a fairly common occurrence. It happens to people. Oh. And, huh? And I have no rational explanation for it, but I know that it's true. What you're saying is true. What Starfire is saying is true. These things occur. I can't explain them. Apparently, Starfire thinks that she can. Well, uh, I, I don't know if it's a perceptual thing or not. Only uh, I, there are other things that have happened. Like we've had a number of incidents involving newspapers where – we will read something in the newspaper, or uh -huh. one of us will, and then it won't be there anymore <laughs> until a few days later. I've had so many of those, Whitley. It was so many of those. Well, exactly. They're very common. Only, in my case, annoyingly enough, 
uh, it never involves things like the stock market or the lottery numbers. I mean, but uh, in fact, uh, what, here's one for both of you. Um, I talked about this years ago. I I thought in my world that uh, Nelson Mandela. Remember Nelson Mandela? Oh, that yeah. He had, that he had died. I remember distinctly that he had passed. Uh, and, of course, not. He had then gone on to, you know, head up South Africa. And uh, I, I was absolutely, for the longest time, completely befuddled. Uh, I thought absolutely he had passed. But that was in some other world, some other time, some other place, apparently, because that obviously, all the time. He, right? Yeah, I, I actually. Well, stuff I can tell you about that. I that, I've called her about that many times. Right. Different things. I do have the answer to that for you. I can solve the mystery for you right now. Please. Um, uh, Nelson Mandela uh, is a person that I call a time shift living dead person. In fact, Nelson Mandela being dead, being alive, being dead, being alive, is documented on my interdimension research list. Um, and you can read about the Time Shift Living Dead on my website. Here's how it works. The Time Shift Living Dead phenomenon art that you have experienced, that Whitley has, that I have, that millions of people have, happens because when, time, when the timeline is altered, when a time shift occurs, no two timelines are exactly the same. And so whatever events have been altered in one timeline, you may have one timeline where you have a Nelson Mandela who has died, and then another timeline where he's alive. There is a glitch in the core matrix programming that is allowing our brains to remember dual timelines. I call these dual timeline memory conflicts. This is the evidence your brain needs to jar you into realize, realizing that something is a little screwy with the reality. So right now we have, tell me, Art, is Nelson Mandela right now, is he alive or dead? You know, uh, I, th- <laughs> <laughs> I think that he's alive. Um, I don't want to stick my neck out, but I think that he's alive. I'm not sure. That is correct. Oh, In course. this current dominant <laughs> timeline, Nelson Mandela, thankfully, is alive. Okay? Aye, aye, aye. Yes. So, but your brain, your brain remembers, as is also documented on my interdimension list, my brain remembers, too, that Nelson Mandela died. Now, let's check a memory marker for you, Art. Do you remember any of the circumstances surrounding his death? His death? Um, no, I, I do not. No. Okay. Wh- where did you hear about it? Did you read about it, seeing on the TV news? Did Starfire, somebody mention I, it to I you? I don't know. I, I I actually kind of remember that it was big news when big he news. died. I, you know, all over the media. Obviously, if Nelson Mandela passed, it'd be all over the media, right? So you know, it's interesting uh, that you bring Nelson Mandela up in particular, Art, because she's got a lot of stuff about this particular person being alive and dead on her website, as I recall. My, my longtime listeners, Whitley, know this is, is damn well true. Um, I talked about it on the air quite a bit years ago, so mm. they know it's true. I and, would love to know if I could get a date. Uh, for the first show that you ever mentioned this on, that would I would love to incorporate that into my research, if you wouldn't mind. If somehow there's a way, I would. Oh, there there is a way with uh, recorded radio programs. Of course, somebody has to start going through archives like crazy and trying to you know try to figure out when it was. But you have a uh, lot it was of years, listeners, so years ago. Putting out the 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 request, if anybody uh, can really provide the actual recording of from. Art Bell's radio show when he mentioned that Nelson Mandela died or that he realized he has a memory that Nelson Mandela died, but now he realizes that Nelson Mandela is alive. Yes. Please get this information to Art Bell and myself and Whitley Strieber. Oh, I promise you it, it can be recovered, uh, Starfire. Um, I guarantee it'll take some work, but it it can definitely be recovered. Right. Now, what has happened there, Art, is our brains, yours, mine, Whitley's, everybody's brains are the interface to the core matrix. 
And it's through this interface that the programming for the timeline, for the timeline, the reality of the timeline is processed. All right, so all I, hold it right there. I, I, I hate to interrupt. But we're, and Whitley, you also hold on, please. We're at a break point. We'll be right back from Manila in the Philippines, Southeast Asia. I'm Art Bell. Eddie, Eddie, thank you from Rio Grande, New Mexico, said, Art, uh, didn't you receive a lot of calls from people who also believe that Nelson Mandela had died? I remember you commenting several times that you got those calls, and that's Eddie and a lot of other people who've responded. You can send me a fast blast on the coasttocoastam.com website, and uh, I'd love to have you do it. Anybody who can remember any associated dates with that, um, I'd certainly appreciate it. All right, Starfire Tour is my guest along uh, at the moment with Whitley Streber, and we're trying to make some sense out of something that I'm not sure ultimately will make sense out of, but it certainly is a real phenomena. It, it's an absolutely real phenomena, whatever it is. We'll be right back. Okay, Tom uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio, asks if we can keep Starfire pinned to specific examples and not in la-la land of theory. Well, not in a, not with a subject like this, really. Um, this is a real phenomena, but uh, getting to the absolute bottom of it, I don't know. We'll see as time goes on. Leo in Mountain View, California, asks a very pertinent question. Do time shifts happen to some people more than others? In other words... Do some people remain mostly in one timeline? I think for the most part, I'm one of those. I have always, in a way, envied people who can sort of mentally go into la-la land and ignore reality. I've always felt stuck in reality, stuck in the moment, and unable to sort of use my imagination to travel elsewhere as a kind of an escape. I've never been able to do that too damn sane, frankly. Starfire and uh, Whitley, welcome back. Well, Art, I, you know, listening to, the, to that comment about uh, grounding it more in theory, there, there's a very interesting aspect of quantum theory that may apply here. There's the famous paradox of Schrodinger's cat, which is a cat mm-hmm. is placed in a box in which a random event may or may not cause the cat to be killed. Uh, now, so therefore, we can't know until we open the box whether or not the cat is alive or dead. This is the so-called uh, observer's paradox, or quantum in- indeterminacy. Uh, in, at the quantum level, the fact is that the cat would be alive and dead at the same time until the box was opened, and the so-called superposition that the cat was in uh, uh defined itself into a certain state once the box was open. No, that's absolutely right, Whitley. And, and then I also believe there's an observational problem with, with quantum physics in the first place. In other words, when you actually watch it happen, it won't happen. Um, well, exactly. But, it, but the, uh, the thing that most, one of the most interesting things about the whole idea of quantum uh, events Taking place at a lar- on a larger scale has been re- it's been recently discovered. Previously, it was always believed that quantum events and say, things like superposition and indeterminacy and quantum entanglement only happened on a very, very, very small scale, like the things that like photons and electrons and nothing mm-hmm. larger. Recently, it's been discovered that a fullerene, which is a, an actual particle. It's certainly not large, but by our standards, but in terms and compared to a photon, it's enormous. It can also be observed in superposition. This means that physical matter actually can go into superposition. And what that means, means in us. terms of our perception and our experience of the world, nobody actually knows. Mm-hmm. In All other right. words... Start- Starfire, if if I may interrupt, with regard to what Leo asked, uh, do these time shifts happen to some people more than others? Do do some people remain mostly in one timeline while others are shifting sort of back and forth or observing things that are changing? Okay. With a time shift, it's happening to everyone, whether you're consciously aware of it or not. There's nothing you can do about it. But there are some people 
like who experienced a time shift living dead event that are having memories of at least two different timelines. How can, how can your brain both have a memory of Nelson Mandela being alive and Nelson Mandela being dead? These are very final um, outcomes. So this is where someone's brain somehow, for some reason, the assimilation that the core matrix does to cause people to never notice that timelines are changing, to always think that whatever's around them is the way it's always been. But that's not true. That's an illusion. Whitley, when he first had his sort of time jump, when he was walking and he contacted me about it, that was sort of a, a first awareness, and he thought of me. And from that point on, he began having more and more and more of these types of time slips that we began to document. Um, you would be the same, uh, Art. You wouldn't just be having a singular um, dual timeline memory conflict. You would be having other weird things happening, too. But the way that my research begins is I take a phenomenon like why do masses of people think that a very alive Nelson Mandela actually had died? And these are people from all over the world, do not communicate with each other, do not know what's going on, but they're contacting me independently, privately, to tell me this. That's fair. So I have to say, what is this phenomenon? Mm -hmm. Okay? So this is where, you, you know... You, you have to understand that this is a phenomenon which is ignored by mainstream science, but is only one in thousands of interrelated phenomena and anomalies, all of which take you down a road, if you follow it, to present the core matrix, time shift, reality shift, coexisting timelines, and all of the other phenomena. All right. I'll give you a very quick example of another one that's occurred to me. Great. Uh, when I was younger, I can recall driving. Um, you know, I love to drive. And uh, any number of times when I was driving, not a lot, but a number, I would uh, suddenly realize that I had arrived at a place, a town, um, or a destination that I'd been going to, and I didn't have the slightest idea how the last hour passed. I had no memory of the past hour of driving. And it scared the you-know-what out of me yeah. uh, b because you're out of control. I don't like feeling out of control. But I was just suddenly there. And obviously the time had passed. Obviously I didn't get into a crash or do something stupid. I drove, but I had no memory of about an hour of the driving. Now, that has happened to a lot of people, not just me. That's I guess that's a time shift, right? Well, not necessarily. Um, I have scientific criteria that I do all anomalous investigations. So the first thing I do is I have to weed out any regular, normal thing. Were you daydreaming? How fast were you going? <laughs> what was the traffic like? Do you remember passing this or that? And once I go through all of the criteria that will tell me if this is just somebody who wasn't paying attention or was speeding and got someplace faster, once I put that out of the way, then with that out of the way, it's still not answered, that's when we go into a time shift. And this also involves missing time. And in some cases may even involve what some people believe are extraterrestrial abductions. I mean, there are many branches of the, how did I get there so fast? Or why did it take me so long? You know, where did the four hours go on a 30 minute driving trip? Yeah, these oh. are all legitimate questions. Uh, and here comes another one. You've come up with the term matrix and core matrix. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, everybody's gonna say, hey, grab that one from the movie. Right, right. right. Um, well, um, when the Matrix movie came out, I had been discussing uh, my research for a very long time prior to the Matrix movie, and I did call the core Matrix the Matrix. When the movie came out, which is science fiction, I really was getting a little 
concerned that people were thinking that my research was the movie explanation for the matrix. So I renamed it the core matrix. And to help people along on my website, you will find uh, an article that I wrote about time shifts uh, in Quest magazine. It predates the matrix movie. So, and anyone who knows anything about how hardcover magazines are published, you know that this was started three months even before that date and that this is a research project. So it was even well before that. Okay. And so I have a number of articles that just help people out who seem to think that um, somehow I came on board the Matrix train after mm-hmm. the movie. It's not true. Okay. Um, all right. Whitley, so these things are, they're real. I mean, they really happen. Um, I, um, I, I'm not sure what else you can add, uh, except uh, all of this really does occur, and it occurs to uh, perhaps even billions of people. And I think that a lot of times people simply, I, I, well, as an example, uh, when you're driving and, and suddenly you're there, you have a startled moment and right. even a m- moment of being scared. But after that, you kind of mentally manage to one way or the other rationalize and dismiss the experience unless it's, it's right. called back as in doing a show right now. You sort right. of dismiss it because life goes on, folks. Right. I, I think that the, the boundary between the classical and quantum worlds is actually fuzzier than we would like to believe. Uh, and there are, like I referred to earlier, there are experiments that are bringing uh, the mass limit so far up, so, so, so to speak, up higher and higher all the time, step by step. And I think ultimately we're going to find out that we, that the so-called classical world where everything works in a mechanical way and uh, one follows two and all time is linear, is in our minds. That the real world is what we're seeing when we glimpse things like time shifts, all that's happening is for a second we're seeing reality, not what we f- choose to filter out. Because if we didn't filter that out, our minds would be perceiving everything and so chaotically we, wouldn't, we would be helpless. I'm not sure this is in any way uh, related, but I'm going to give it a shot. Uh, my daughter, Asia... Um, like all children, you know, she's two and a half now, and I guess like all children, she's got an incredibly active imagination. I mean, for her, these things she does are real. When she dips her spoon into an imaginary cup and then takes a sip or a bite of whatever was in the imaginary cup or even something more complex and complicated, it's absolutely real to her. When she sits in a chair and looks down and says, she said, Age, we call her Ace, Ace in boat, you know, Ace is in a boat and she's looking down and she says she can see water and she can see fish or even a little more startling. uh, And this is still going on now, everybody. She'll be in the bedroom and she'll look at the ceiling and she will say hi. And it's done repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. Like there's somebody on that ceiling. Now, either that's a child's imagination or when children are very small and about her age, they see things that they have not yet been taught not to see. I'm not sure what's real. <laughs> if you ask uh, Schrodinger, Schrodinger's cat, he'd probably say it's both. Well, I, I would like to be able to explain some of the actual hard evidence that I have for time shifts. Because uh, it did take a leap from the anecdotal research that I was doing to the hard evidence, which brought me to some very astonishing eureka moments. That's why I'm so confident. Okay. All right. Well, that's fair enough. And I I want you to do that. Evidence is uh, important. Uh, Whitley, is there anything else that you'd like to add? Well, yeah. Actually, Art, I have an experience that happened in December of 2007 but it's pretty long. It, it, it'll take me a, a few minutes to get through it. No, go ahead. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, this was, this was like, once again, uh, you know, I had at this point known Starfire for a couple of years, and I had just published the book 2012, The War for Souls, and right 
after the book was published, which was published in August, in September, uh, David Deutsch, this is a book about parallel universes, 2012. Mm -hmm. And uh, David Deutsch at, the, uh, at Oxford published uh, an announcement to the effect that he thought that parallel universes were physically real, which was quite startlingly coincidental because my book was about this poor doofus writer who's writing a novel that turns out to be an actual history in a parallel universe, and they start coming after him to try to change the novel in order to change history in their own world. It's, it's, it's interesting. But anyway, I went to bed that night in uh, December, of, December the 7th of 2007 at about 11.30. I woke up and uh, meditated for a while at around 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, then uh, I woke up at 4.53, and at this point in my life, I was always, anytime anything unusual happened, I was looking at the clock because of Starfire, knowing her. <laughs> and uh, it was so exactly 4.53, I woke up because I felt somebody clutching, clutching the two fingers of my right hand, which was, Anne was asleep. She sleeps on the other side of the bed. So it was, you know, it wakes you right up because there's not supposed to be anyone else in the house. And uh, I opened my eyes, looked at the clock, and I could see something outside glowing. It was a very stormy night. The, the clouds were just pouring past. I could see the single light in the sky. And I sat up, and as soon as I moved, the light was gone. But I went down again, so I thought, well, maybe I just dreamed it. And there it was again. So I woke Anne up. We didn't, neither one of us could see it, except, except from just that one position. So uh, I, you know, I was trying to get a camera to take a picture of it and so forth. But then uh, I uh, eventually couldn't, it went away and we couldn't see any more of it. I had a very strange feeling about it, though, because it really seemed like some kind of a UFO. Then I went to bed. I went back to sleep. Dan went back to sleep. Then suddenly I was awake and I was uh uh, started awake, and I went into the thought that something was wrong. I could hear something in the living room, and I got up. I went into the living room, and it was completely different. It was another room. It had four uh, four decorative plants in it. It was just not the same room at all. Right. And then I proceeded to go through. I turned around to go back in the bedroom. Because it scared the dickens out of me, frankly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've had experiences of extraordinary movement into different dimensions or whatever. And I'm always afraid I'll never get back. And indeed, there was a wall where the hallway had been a few seconds before. Wow. And I, I, what then proceeded to happen was I went through five different life, lives that were all unfolding at the same time. In another one, I was in my old family home in San Antonio, and it was very run down. Uh, I was married to, still, to Anne, and uh, we were very poor. In another one, she had died of the stroke she had in 2004, and I was walking alone along a, a, a beachfront with my grandson. In a third, uh, we were asleep in another apartment, but in, in a, it's and and uh, in this world, I was still lying in bed, and the fingers that had grasped my hand were still tucking around. It was just the most bizarre period of a few minutes that you could possibly imagine. It was well, absolutely Whitley, I, you know, I think all of this puts you into the category of somebody who, uh, like Starfire, who has these experiences more frequently than the rest of us, but the rest of us have them as well. Uh, uh, enough, uh, enough truth in that that I think a lot of the audience is resonating with what they're hearing, but I, I, I've never had anything quite as extensive as you have with i listen i want to thank you for coming on tonight and you know we'll sort of take it from there uh but i understand completely what you're saying whitley oh buddy we'll do a whole show together uh pretty soon how about that thanks a lot all right all right take care and good night whitley and starfire tour will be back following the break uh this this 
There is something to all of this, folks. This is just not fantasy unveiled. These are experiences that, well, I want to say they're real. They certainly feel real. I'm Art Bell. I bid all the creatures of the night a good day, a good evening, a good morning, whatever. Now, we are creatures of the night. My guest is Starfire Tour. Uh, Whitley added quite a bit. And we're going to... Um, we're going to turn to Starfire in a moment for the evidence, uh, real evidence of all this that she talked about. I have no idea what all of this really is about. Uh, it may be as Starfire suggests, but hearing the actual evidence of this uh, is worth staying up late if that's the situation you're in. So leave the radio right where it is and we'll be right back. Well, all right, Starfire, welcome back. Uh, it's evidence time. So you went farther than um, I think most all of us have gone with this, and you tried to document and prove that these occurrences were real, not just a simple quick aberration of the mind of some sort or another. Uh, so what, what can you tell me about evidence? Okay, here it comes. First of all, I just want to state that no scientist is worth anything if they try to gather the evidence to fit their own theory. That's not good science. And I do perform good science. I simply followed the clues. I followed the research. I did not expect what the outcome would come. And as a matter of fact, when I did discover about the core matrix and time shifts, I, was, I actually went into a depression because this was not at all what I thought the world was. Okay? Sure. Now, back in, on June 29, 2001, and this is just one example of, of a lot of physical documentation that I have. I'm just focusing on one particular time. On June the 29, 2001, um, I was running an investigation in an area in Southern California uh, that I had noticed um, buildings changing, uh, time shifting around. And so I took some people uh, with me on this particular day to do a research. And, um, and we did... Um, Notice uh, uh, a time shift occurring. Things were changing. Uh, I called uh, someone that I work with now and then, the stage performance magician, Brandon Scott. Um, I utilize Brandon in my reality shift manifestation experiments because uh, he is an expert in um, uh, not only um, hand magic and prestidigitation, but if someone is uh, trying to make it look like they can make something appear, but they're really doing some form of stage magic, he can mm -hmm. spot it right away. In other words, so he's an expert in deception. That's right. He is an expert in deception. I'm also an expert in deception, but his type of expertise is the type of person I bring into research situations. Okay. So I call Brandon after this uh, time shift has happened. He brought his video cam. And, um, and he began to videotape whatever I was pointing out for him to do. One of the things that he videotaped was an establishing shot, which I wanted. And for those of you in the entertainment industry, an establishing shot is just a pan of the a larger area where you are focused on a smaller area so that you know where you are. Okay? Okay, sure. So, uh, so he took an establishing shot of what was a, a very, very, very large parking lot uh, in uh, a suburban um, market zone. Uh, there were some large restaurants, uh, buildings, um, and so that's all that was meant to be was an establishing shot. And like so many great things in science that have been discovered from sheer dumb luck, that's what happened to me here. Uh, I was looking over the tapes, and... I saw the establishing shot, and I put it up on the shelf. A few months later, in, uh, in early November of 2001, um, a friend and I, someone who had been with me on that June 29th day, I brought them back to that location to see whether or not anything else had changed. And in this one moment, in a 45-minute time period, a huge building appeared in that parking lot that had not been there 45 minutes before. It was a circuit city building the size of a warehouse. It was huge. Now, the thing about this particular uh, time shift event happening um, was that all along I was uh, publishing 
um, my reports on my interdimension list, and some of them would go on to my um, publicly available um, website. So, uh, so as we're going along, there is a genesis to what I'm about to tell you. So here in early November 2001, this huge Circuit City building appears, and I go in there, and I do what I usually do. I have a way that I interview people who suddenly appear in a timeline who I know really shouldn't be there. So I interview the managers, and I interview the workers there. I never tip them off or front load them that I'm going, hey, where did you come from? You weren't here 45 minutes ago. No, no, no. I go in and I say, oh, this is great. How long has the building been here? Uh, how long have you been working here? And I have them sign affidavits. Okay, and then I take a lot of photographs and a lot of video of the Circus City building from a lot of different angles. Now, here's where the dumb luck comes in. If you didn't think that dumb luck was involved in all the rest of that, I go back to look at the footage from 629 to see whether or not we had captured anything uh, in that establishing shot uh, where the Circuit City building should not have been. And sure enough, I have a video that Brandon Scott took from 629-2001 panning of that exact area. You can see all of the buildings where the Circus City should have been, but where the Circus City was now, there's nothing. It's just a parking lot. No Circuit City. Not there at all. Yet I have affidavits, affidavits and documents from the actual company saying that that Circuit City had been built there, had been placed there, had been opened up there a year before. I had affidavits from the workers there and the management that they had been there a year before. This is a documented example, example of two different versions of the same timeline, and I had the documented evidence proof positive. Where, where this was this? Uh, in, in what city was this? Uh, this is in uh, Southern California. In Southern California. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, right, right. And a lot of circuit cities disappeared in recent years. <laughs> you know, they went, well, they went under. But um, back then, under, no. I know. So what, what you're saying is you had an establishing shot, June 29, 2001, mm-hmm. of this parking lot. And, um, A huge you, parking lot. You, uh, all right. And you're saying that the space... That the Circuit City occupied um, today, today wasn't there then. Wasn't there then? It, it was only it was only a parking lot, and and, and there, in other words, the Circuit City did not suddenly appear where other businesses had been. It appeared in in the parking lot. That is correct. There there were um, large other uh, buildings on the fringe rimming this parking lot. There were yeah. restaurants, and there was a tire store. Okay? okay, and the Circuit City did not take over any of those buildings. The Circuit City building came into manifestation and within this 45-minute time that we went to lunch. It just appeared in a place where there was no building before, and I have the videotape. It's not even a still shot. It's a videotape mm-hmm. of this, and because it's, a, it's an establishing shot, Brandon, I asked Brandon to pan, and he panned. So you can see the other buildings, the restaurants, the tire store, uh, uh, the parking lot, and and where the Circuit City building later appeared a few months later. There's just no building there. There's just a parking lot and some trees, and that's about it. That's evidence. And I have that's evidence. Uh, have oh, you yeah. that's, that's, uh, ha- have you posted all this on your website? No, uh, no, no. Oh, no. I I have not. Um, um, I've shared it with academia, you know, uh, but I I have not yet um, um, decided on the vehicle that I want to release this. I intend okay. to release this. I want to share this. The reason I'm I'm I I talk to the public is I do want to turn on the light switch in their brain. Um, I just don't want to be one of those people who just has an opinion. You know, I've done some interesting research, and here's my opinion. No. My opinions are based on hard evidence, so that when I do come across um, anecdotal information, I have created a scientific criteria to investigate the anomaly or the experience. 
All right. Well, what you've told me is absolutely incredible. I mean, uh, fine. It yeah. does sound like hard evidence. Now, uh, how many people have you shared this with and what have they said when you've presented them with the evidence? I've shared it with about 50 or 60 people. Uh-huh. Um, obviously, the people who were there at that time, because I got there, uh, I had them write their own reports right? Uh, from their own point of view. I've showed it to certain people that I work with, some scientists, uh, um, you know, I have researched that particular land. I want to know what's underneath it, what's above it. So I talk to geologists. Um, there's an earthquake fault that is very near there. You know, I, I check those things out when it comes. Uh, there's what I believe is a vortex there. This is an area where time goes wonky quite a bit. So I, I do deal with quite a number of people, and I really didn't want to present uh, this hard evidence without having the right platform and without having enough data to go with it that I was really going to make a positive contribution to the understanding of the nature of our of our world. And now oh, I know... But you you I said you presented this to some academics. Um, academics are interesting people. They look at uh, facts. So when, right. when they look at the establishing shot from June 29, 2001, and then the November stuff and and all the affidavits you've you know that is proof and so how do they react to that how do they do they write it off do they say i have no idea or well, what do they say right well uh m- most of the academics that i have worked with i actually also bring to the site it's one thing to you know look at cameras and i also have the film documented as being authentic not messed around with uh no photoshopping no no uh, digital this or that. Uh, that's really important. You have to start from the ground up when you're going to build a case like this. Uh, right. So whenever possible, I do bring my my experts uh, to the location so that they can see the angles of the shots. The people that I work with know me well enough that I am only looking for their science information. I'm looking for the most intelligent people to deal with. I want to know their opinion. And... If they have an opinion that is a different one than mine, I want to hear that. I want everything on the table. And if I've made a mistake anywhere down the line, I want to know now because I cannot afford to have any information in a, in a research project that is not uh, proven to be uh, supportive. Well, you, that's absolutely right. But so that's why I'm asking what sort of reaction did you get to amazed. this kind of hard evidence? I amazed, mean, it, it, amazed, of course, upset. They're amazed, upset. They all realize that I've turned science on its ear. And I explain I really haven't. Uh, It's just the next step in science and that quantum physicists, as they all know, are heading in this direction. And I'm hoping to meet them somewhere in the middle. That's about it, you know. Uh, They recognize what I do is real because... I brought too much information to them for them to disrespect who I am and what I do. And because I don't want them to support me blindly, I won't even work with somebody like that. I'm not interested, but I'm also not interested in somebody whose ego is so invested in only what they put out into the world, even if it turns out to be now proven to be not quite right. I'm not interested in those people either. I want well, you're you're talking about a majority of scientists. That's you know, okay. Their egos are pretty invested in. That's, that's okay. Um, different scientists. Some of them they go and they get grants, and so they can't even say they know me. Mm-hmm. You know, publicly they can't even say they know me mm-hmm. because they sure lose their grant money. And I understand this. You know, um, uh, uh, I'm independent. You know, I don't depend on. Uh, politics. So I can sit here and talk with you and tell you I'm going to present all of these things to the public in the right format with the right support system because I want you to have it. And and remember, this is only just one of my pieces of hard evidence. And any anybody would take a look at this hard documentation and say, what has happened, what is going on here? And so I want them to tear it to shreds. I want them to take a look, like I said, at the very beginning, is there manipulation of the video? 
is there somehow the video was taken from a strange angle that makes it look like the building's not there when it was there all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. All of that has been gone through because that's how I think. When I, do, when I work with other experts in a variety of fields, I look at their work and I'm critiquing it myself going, is this somebody who can really meet me and bring to the table everything they know and if they discover something that I have that they realize alters their data, are they willing to advance their data? Those are the type of people that I'm... A lot, I'm yeah, a lot of scientists, of course, are not willing to do that at all. Um, but, but okay, many that's are. one very good piece of evidence, I will admit. Um, we've got time, so if you have other evidence, other things that you've documented, I'd love to hear about them. Great, I'll share them with you. Fire away. Okay. Um, one of the things um, I know that... Um, that Whitley Strieber is very aware of, and so is a lot of the world, is something that I do called reality shift manifestation. Um, a reality shift um, is not something that I discovered. Um, I discovered time shifts in the core matrix and all that, but reality shift is associated with the fabric of the way that our timeline is created. Um, what I did was I discovered what a reality shift actually is and how it functions. Um, in brief, it is a localized phenomenon where something in somebody's local world alters. The entire timeline does not change. It's just something about them changes. Um, I have been running experiments for years and years and years. Uh, to have items actually materialize. Yes, I have this on video and I have these on uh, photographs. I was running experiments with my interdimension research list, which, by the way, if the public would like to join, if they're interested, they can ask, go there and ask. Um, and I created, as I studied how the core matrix worked, which also leads to the discovery I discovered why the brain dreams. Our interface with the core matrix, the dreaming brain, is for the most part, you are interfacing with the streaming data of coexisting timelines, which is how Whitley Strieber could see all of these other uh, lifetimes, uh, versions of lifetimes that he was explaining. He was actually accessing multiple timelines at the same time. People do that all the time. I discussed this phenomenon on my interdimension research list. So, I developed um, a protocol that I call reality shift manifestation, where I can actually alter uh, part of the fabric of reality. And I did that publicly August 31st of this year. Uh, you, 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 you may recall that there were some deadly wildfires in California. I do indeed. Okay. And... Um, now, privately, on my interdimension list, we had been experimenting, seeing if we could do a reality ship ma manifestation to bring rain to where there are fires. And we had had some success. And so for these wildfires, uh, my group and I decided that we would also uh, uh, do it to help out. And we do this privately, quietly, not for All the right. public. But. All right, Starfire, we are at another break point, so hold tight. Reality shift manifestation, bringing rain to an area that has wildfires. I think we can work in that area a little bit. We've done some of that, haven't we? From Manila in the Philippines, Southeast Asia, I'm Art Bell. We'll be right back. Here I am filling in for George, a well-deserved night off for George, um, doing the show Every night is uh, quite an incredible feat, and so uh, it's a well-deserved night off. All right, um, Starfire mentioned reality shift manifestation, and um, in that context, bringing rain to an area that needed rain when the wildfires were going on. That, of course, <laughs> it forced me to immediately um, remember and recall the experiments that we did. Uh, I forget, eight or nine experiments. And these experiments... Imagine Starfire knows about them, uh, but we produced rain 
Uh, we tried to focus, I don't know, a lot of you are new listeners, but years ago we tried to, I got very interested in all of this, focusing intention and causing weather changes. And we did a whole number of experiments. And we did, in fact, produce rain in areas that not only needed it, but had no forecast for rain, uh, areas that uh, had drought and all the rest of it. And all of this went on to manifest itself uh, in people suggesting that we turn storms, you know, hurricanes and that sort of thing. And then I finally got cold feet. um, And I got cold feet because it worked. It absolutely worked. And the, uh, the evidence for that is all over the airwaves in years past. Uh, You can go back and listen to it if you wish. If you don't believe it, we tried to focus uh, millions of minds. We did, in fact, do that, and we did that, rather, and we did, in fact, uh, accomplish it. We produced rain. There's no question about it. A couple of the experiments involved people's health. That also worked. You can regard it as anecdotal evidence if you want to. But the weather changes that we did were real, and all of it is, is documented and was broadcast on the air. So call it reality shift manifestation or call it focusing intention or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but in years past, we did that. We'll, we'll talk more about all of that with Starfire Tour in a moment. Right back. Well, all right, Starfire, um, reality shift manifestation. Um, I have the luxury, or I had the luxury at that time, and I guess in a way now as well, of being on the air in front of millions of people. So we did these experiments. It came out of consciousness um, ex- experimentation that, that was going on at uh, various universities. Uh, at any rate, uh, we did... Pro- are, are you aware of the experiments? I would imagine you are. I am aware. You are aware. I'm aware not of what you're talking about. You're making it rain. That I did not know. I'm I'm hearing this for the first time, but I am aware of intention experiments. Okay. All right. Well, we did this on the air in front of millions of people, and we did it uh, eight or nine times. (laughs) Uh, Oh, you should definitely look into that because it it was as, as real as a heart attack. So you call it one thing, call it focusing intention or mass consciousness or whatever you want to call it. but. Um, it, it, do you see it as different from reality shift manifestation? No, no, no. A- as I said, I did not discover reality shifts. They are a natural part of the human ability. What I did do was I discovered what it actually is, how it works, the mechanism. And because I discovered the mechanism, I'm, I've been able to create protocols that if you follow my protocols, you get a reality shift. Okay? So, um Here's how it works in a nutshell. I've already explained that the brain is the interface to the core matrix, and even the dreaming brain accesses the streaming data from coexisting timelines. That's mainly what dreams are. So um, what I've taught is that let's say you have these wildfires in California. In fact, this is exactly how we did it. This is documented. Anybody can come onto my lift or they can join my Facebook, and they can actually see They can go back and look at the timestamps and read what I wrote and read the responses, including Whitley Strieber's, and you will see that this actually happened. Okay? And, yes, this will be very familiar to you now, Art. Okay. So the reality shift works this way. Uh, You have the wildfire and dry. No rain is predicted. Okay, so that anyone in the world can, no matter where they are, can look at the weather reports in that part of Southern California or California in general and see no rain is predicted, not even for the week. Done. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now, using the interface of the brain, I I roll through coexisting timelines looking for one where it is raining, where I want it to rain. And once I find that, I make a copy paste. Okay. And through our joint efforts with the brain, we copy, paste it, and we do an edit into the dominant timeline. Okay, and I'm edit... a little confused. Hold on. Okay. You say you, you go through or you look through other timelines. Well, uh, how do you do that? I teach it. <laughs> I mean, you just can't do it. You know, I'm, I'm being very quick with my words, uh, but... I have, well, we, have the, we have the luxury of time with a program like this. So okay. I, I want to understand, is this a mental process only? You, you sit down, close your eyes, and go through what you consider to be different timelines and find one where 
it rained. Is that is that the process? Or if not, take the time to explain to me what the process is. Okay. Using your brain and the soul, uh, anything and everything that allows you to, uh, you can call it psychic if you want, um, you can call it the interface connection. Um, some people who I work with need to go find what's called a vortex, some place where their own energy is amplified. Um, sometimes what are called haunted locations work for that as well. Um, but what, what I teach is um, for, for people to use their brains primarily to reach out through the bridge work uh, of the various frequencies of coexisting timelines until they find one where there is rain falling okay. in the area that we need it. If we can't find rain, there will be no manifestation of rain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a, that's a rule for reality shift manifestation. Uh, I take people through a variety of exercises that I teach to hone their brains to be able uh, to do this, to, to take their brains out of, um, the am the amnesia uh, that they're in. Uh, it, in fact, some of um, the methodology is just to get people to smell new things, go to new places, think about new things, to to uh, to educate new gray matter, to 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 formulate their brains even before they go to sleep. I have them think about certain um, images. Um, certain colors, um, certain things in their own lives so that their, their brain is not trapped in only the assimilation, the dumbness, the amnesia that the core matrix wants everyone to think that it's a singular timeline, nothing unusual is going on, go with the program and live your life. Pay no attention to the little man behind the curtain, such as in The Wizard of Oz. So through, you know, over the years, I've developed ways to help to enhance the brain to be able to de detect the difference between just daydreaming and thinking to when it's actually glommed onto a coexisting timeline. In fact, scientists now have been talking about ways to, to um, amplify the brain, even to... Um, to help um, prevent Alzheimer's and other loss of, of brain power simply by introducing new techniques, new games, new things for the brain to do. Well, I, I've been doing that for years. All right. Well, once one has um, mentally located a, a timeline in which uh, there was rain involved uh, with the California wildfires, then uh, how do you impose that timeline on the current timeline and produce the rain. It, it, it's by focusing intention, yes? Yes, it, it, it becomes an act of intention, but the intention has rules because we know that we are copy-pasting from a coexisting timeline. And when you copy-paste, just like on, on your computer, okay. mm -hmm. you're not taking it away. You're leaving the original and you're making an exact duplicate and mm -hmm. bringing that over. Okay, and anything that you find in any coexisting timeline is some event, scenario, bite or bit that exists in the core matrix. It is not creation. It is manipulation of the assets. Okay, so I want to make that very, very clear. And yeah, but I don't, I don't, I don't know that it is very, very clear. Um, I see exactly what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know that it's very, very clear that it is in any way different from um, somebody or even millions of people. And I, I want to talk to you about sure. the numbers of people involved in doing this and whether it makes a difference or whether one person can actually do it. I'm not sure of that myself. I think that uh, millions of minds focusing intention on something like changing the weather somewhere may be... 
and I say maybe, more powerful than a, sing- a single person doing it. Actually, I, I'm, it, it's not, and I'm going to give you an example of the fallibility of that. And if okay. you'll just remind me in about a minute, I just want to complete this thought so sure. I don't leave you or myself or, or the listeners sort of up in the air on this. I'm concerned about that. Um, I just want to say that um, using the, the protocol, which we will revisit in more detail, using the protocol of reality shift manifestation, uh, I announced to the world I was going to do this, I guess the way that you did what you did, Art. and. So anybody could see that there was no chance of rain, and I said when the rain was going to fall, and and so it did. Okay, and so okay. it did. And, and you have all of this. You have all of this. This documented. is documented. Any mm-hmm. of your listeners, you don't have to be a scientist. Any of your listeners can I can can join my Facebook or my interdimension list, and you can go. It, it's right there. It's time stamped. It's on my profile page. You can see where I post what I'm going to do. You can see when I did it. You can see the comments during the comments after um, where people are bringing the evidence forward and they're posting um, links to pouring rain here and pouring rain there and the moisture going up mm-hmm. here. It was, in, it, it was great. And normally I do this sort of work very privately Either I'm doing it myself or with a small group or through my research list. The reason why I chose to make this public at that time was I saw this as as the perfect conditions to show people that these reality shifts are instantaneous as far as their consciousness is concerned. And, And they can all see that there was no rain forecast before, and now there's rain on time, as I said there would be. So now I am demonstrating the, the accuracy of my understanding of the research that I do and the claims that I'm making, that I understand how the mechanics of how it works, and I've just proven it to you. So No, you, you haven't. Um, you've proven to me that what you did worked. You haven't proven to me that um, what you call reality shift manifestation is in any way uh, different than the focusing of intention. Um, well, it may be a different method to the same end. Okay, so, um, I'll, I'll show you the difference. Um, in reality shift manifestation, something that I teach and that I show is that you simply can't have everything you want. It's not a matter of that. You know, uh, there has to be a certain amount of integrity involved and ethics. And if what you want, you can't even find somewhere in a coexisting timeline or with the core matrix, then, you know, if you want it, you can't do it through reality shift manifestation. It's not going to work. So let's say you have somebody who just wants to have all these riches and yachts and all these things, but this is not, this is not their program. The way that I do my reality shift manifestation, you're not going to get it. Now, we've tested that out over the years, and it's turned out to be true. That's how I develop this knowledge. Now, the very groundwork of creating reality shift manifestation uh, protocols comes from earlier research that I did into the, the efficacy of prayer. And, mm-hmm. and, and as we all know that probably globally and historically, uh, intent seems to be wrapped around one's prayer or wishes or desires, okay? That's right. Mm-hmm. Now, I would say that, um, that among all of the prayers done, peace prayers, stopping war, stopping violence, um, globally and historically, I would say that more people have focused more energy on peace prayers than any other intent ever. And yet, what's the result? There's not a single example of a peace prayer, and they're organized to this day. No peace. Not a single peace prayer has created peace. Peace. Now, right there, that's 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 an in-your-face problem. You have to deal with that. What's going on? So in my research, which which I was doing prior to any of these other um, discoveries that I made, I discovered that um, 
that peace prayers generally just do not work. Now, I completely understand that the human brain, the human soul, human energy, powerful. One, powerful. You put together a million, incredibly powerful. That should move mountains, but it doesn't. Why? See, I ask those questions. And here's what I discovered in a nutshell, and part of this is written up on my website to explain the, the genesis of reality ship manifestation. In this world, or coexisting timelines, if you actually make a study of war and peace, you discover that the way that peace comes is through war. People wage wars to bring peace. It's true. So what happens then if you have millions of people praying for peace, yet the programming of the planet, being that we are all a warring planet, is that if you want peace, you must go to war first. So it appears that when you have millions of people focusing on the intent of peace, they're actually creating war. That's what it appears. And if anybody else can bring me any other research that shows me that any, any singular or organized peace prayer has ever brought peace to this planet, please bring it forward. But I've, I've done years of research, and there is none. And I think common sense would show you that it's not there. And that's why, Art, um, I grew so, so concerned about we have all of this human potential, all of this human energy Where is the energy going? Energy isn't destroyed. It has to be transformed into something. So if the intent of the prayer is not manifesting, where is it going? Well, it is manifesting. It's just manifesting in a way that the the timeline is programmed, i.e., war brings peace. Oh, we've got to change that. That has to be changed. That's no good. So... So, I'm, I'm going to have to give that some thought. Well, um, I, I, I absolutely hope you will, and I hope that your listeners will, too. It, it's just one of those sort of wake-up moments for me when I was studying this, going, where is all of this human energy going? Intent absolutely works. Where is it going? Well, it's going to war, war that makes peace. That's where it's going. I mean, where do you think it's going, Art? <laughs> I, I don't. No, and I, I, I told you I'm going to have to give some thought to this. Right. War brings yeah. peace. Peace right. brings well, war. Was... I've... <laughs> yeah, it's a big one. Um, well, yeah, it may be a big <laughs> one. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I, I guess there would be lots of examples of one thing apparently bringing another. Right? I'm not sure that that proves anything. We are I'm a planet not... in constant war. Constantly at war, whether it's tribal war, country war. That's fair. War, war with terrorists. It's war. It's always war. It's conflict. And, if you, and also it's, 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 it's conflicts at work, conflicts at home, conflicts with family, conflicts in the neighborhood. It's everywhere. Well, it may be that intention or reality shift manifestation, whatever you want to call it, doesn't work on human beings. We're at another uh, break point. Maybe it works better on complex things like weather systems who knows but it is an interesting question and i will give it some thought and i am art bell it is uh good morning afternoon or evening whatever it may be wherever you are i am art bell and for george nori who's taking the evening off my guest is starfire tour and i have this uh this weird feeling that what we're discussing with her is um Uh, sort of a a parallel to so many things that we've actually documented on this program, different ideas and methodology for perhaps getting to the same place. But it it certainly feels that way. Uh, Reality shift manifestation, consciousness, focusing of intention. I'm not sure that I see the difference on the war and peace thing. I'm going to have to give that some serious thought in a moment. I want to ask her about uh, 2012. By the way, we had the opening of the movie, uh, 2012, uh, which I saw the other day here at, you know, it released worldwide at the same time. So I went to the theater and saw it. Uh, Great special effects. But the question of 2012, the end of the Mayan calendar, I'm sure she has comments. We'll find out in a moment. 
Well, all right. Once again, Starfire Tour. Uh, Starfire, let's turn away from War and Peace before my mind explodes. And let me ask you about 2012. It's timely because the movie is just out. Lots of great special effects and uh, sort of a story. Uh, but it is the end of the Mayan calendar. And I, I, I wonder how this fits into what you think about uh, uh, about time and about uh, reality shift manifestation and all the rest of it uh, is something really due in our timeline in 2012 or do we shift reality in some way and avoid it what's what do you know well um i do think about that a lot i think something that we all have to realize is that whatever information we got from the mayan calendar there was so much that was destroyed that we really don't know the whole picture of what they were thinking, um, as well as, um, uh, you know, what was the origin of their, of their time calendars, and why do we have nothing where the Mayans are explaining why they themselves apparently abandoned uh, their own um, civilization? That seems to be a missing part, too. So it seems that whatever this 2012 was to them, they apparently weren't going to be around to experience it. So that's a curiosity. It is. Uh, but do you <laughs> think something something is due in 2012 or it's just another year? Okay. Here's the thing. You know, I can just speak personally here. Um, I am somebody who um, does perceive, dream, out-of-body experience, whatever you want to call it, future events. Okay. I'm, I have been, even since I was a little girl, always been dreaming about disasters. Not always disasters, but a lot. Um, before 9-11, you can read it on my website, on 9-10, I posted this whole thing about that. I didn't say the words 9-11, but I, I do talk about the World Trade Center and the military complex going down and attacks and planes and all sorts of things. So take a look. With that in mind, yes, I do have a concern about 2012, but I also know that because of time shifts, because time shifts, I think that whatever might be happening in 2012, we've already experienced in multiple timelines already, and that we're sort of dealing with cross-contamination uh, from coexisting timelines. I think that that's why we're seeing so many awful things happening on the planet now, all these disasters and these wars and... Um, uh, viruses that somehow got loose upon the world. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we will go past it. I don't think it's the end of the world at all. Okay. A lot of at people all. would be pleased to hear that. At all. But um, I think we need to do something about it. Because you know how you're talking about intent? Yes. So many people are focused on 2012 being this disaster. Mm -hmm. I'd like to change that. I'd like to see that change. I mean, from my perspective, if we change the intent to that date is a day of when we all sort of get more enlightened as to what we can do to help ourselves and help each other and be better people and stop all this ridiculous, violent nonsense. Now, that's a shift I could get behind. And if you're talking about intent, we can do that. Well, if you believe uh, intent is the driving force, we can do that. Uh, and if you believe intent is the driving force, uh, Starfire, then um, no, I think according, according reality. to you, real, a reality shift manifestation can, can be accomplished by, i.e., one person. Uh -huh. That's a really good question. I hope not. Uh, it's possible, but I think it would be better uh, if, uh, if, if the planet sort of participated um, you know, I just want to comment. You were saying, well, maybe reality shift manifestation doesn't work for people. It does. Um, I've done for years reality shift manifestation, particularly reality shift healing. And what I'm putting into my book, I have permission to talk about the various people documented who have been healed because of reality shift manifestations. Mm. And these are documented cases, one of which was a family uh, the wife um, was pregnant, and sophisticated tests showed that the child had some very serious medical problems. Uh, we did reality shift manifestation healing, and almost miraculously, instantaneously, 
the baby's fine. The baby's born. It's great. Uh, people have done my reality shift manifestation healing protocols, and they no longer have cancer. They no longer have this and that. It works when you follow the protocols. Um, so it does work for people, uh, Art. Um, but it's still a work in progress. I don't have all the answers. Um, right. None of us do. Oh, so, uh, and, and me, I would never, ever claim that I knew all the answers. That would be ridiculous. Good. Uh, because that's a good way not to be believed the moment you say you've got all the answers. Oh, every time I find out something new, I think, oh, how stupid could I have been not to have seen that? So no, no, no. Mm-hmm. Nobody has all the answers. Time travel. Um, do you think time travel uh, is possible, is in fact being uh, done? Yes. You do. Absolutely. Do you think that it requires um, a machine with great amounts of energy or that it's a mental process? You know, um, I think that the act of time travel is, is, is not just a, a one-stop shop. Um, I think there are a number of ways that time travel can be achieved. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, some of the time shifts that we experience may be caused just by the fact that someone or something is causing a time travel incident. Um, time, time travel alone, uh, you know how I talked about frequencies in the beginning, mm-hmm. yes. um, and we talked about coexisting timelines. Well, one of the realizations that I came to, and there's always room for growth in these types of real- realizations, is that when somebody um, makes an attempt to, say, go forward or backward in time, just the very act of doing so puts them into a coexisting timeline. Mm-hmm. What that means is you really cannot go forward or past in the timeline that you've departed from. So that very act of time traveling, whether or not you're, you, are, you can utilize your brain to actually cause you to, to, to shift from one timeline to another, or you have some sort of a machine or something that is a cross between a machine and biogenetic that can cause you uh, to move about in time, you're not ever in the same timeline. Um, I think that there's a great deal of evidence just in something called oop arts. Uh, You've probably talked about them on your show. These are... um, Things that are found by archaeologists, uh, like uh, the Baghdad Battery, um, mm-hmm. that, that are just what 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 was that doing in the ground? Mm-hmm. You know, in a spark time plugs, period spark where plugs there is embedded in a rock. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I you know. know, it it just makes no sense. It it does make sense when you add knowledge about the core matrix and time shifts and time travel moving through coexisting timelines, then you realize that there is a great sharing of data, bits, bytes, copy-pasting, people, ourselves moving around. One way that I know that we time travel, now this is just a a definition of time travel, is um, it is possible for some people to just be like walking down a road and suddenly they turn a corner and they find themselves in another time. Where are they? This has been talked about for years. People have been um, talking about their out-of-time experiences for years. Or um, there's a very interesting case of the man who was flying his plane from, I think, Miami. He was in the Bermuda Triangle. And he finds himself in some sort of a vortex. The clouds closed in around him. He was lost on radar. Mm-hmm. And then he suddenly come, come, comes out of this, of this um, he calls it electronic fog, and he is, he is in a completely other location physically than he ever could have been or should have been flying that particular plane. No, all these things are absolutely real. I know they, they're documented, I, they happen, and... And they're a science. There's a science. There has to be a science. That well, I, I, I agree that ultimately there, the science will discover why these things are occurring. Right. Uh, but I'm these not sure that we've discovered travel. it yet. <laughs> these are forms of time travel. This, this may not be the standard sci-fi or quantum physical uh, theory of time travel where you get into the machine 
and you want to go forward or backward in time like the movie Back to the Future. But at the very basic level, and I'm not saying it's not there, but the very basic level, um, when you have a dream about a future event, like I do all the time, and I, and I, I post that, and it's very specific, and then that happens like an hour later or a day later or a, a week later, what am I doing? It's a form of time travel. It has to be. And guess what? Millions of people are just like me. It's well, maybe it's I, time travel and maybe it's precognition. I've had a, a precognitive uh, experience that um, I can't ever explain, will never be able to explain. But that could be precognition and not, I, I guess it's a time, it's time travel of a, of a sort, uh, in that you're seeing something that's going to occur at a future moment or a future day. Let me share with you where my, where my research is at this moment. With Star that. fire away. Okay. Um, I puzzle out why do I constantly dream or even just pick up what I call side data download. I'll be daydreaming. I'll be walking around, I'm daydreaming, and I have a vision. And wham, shortly thereafter... That thing happens. But then I also have another type, what you're calling precog, which is I'll have the same type of thing. It's a dream or it's a daydreaming thing. And I see this, you know, this whole scene play out. And then the next day I go to the movie and it's not real. It's a scene in the movie that I'm looking at. What the heck is that about? (laughs) And I find that other people who report to me their precogs, they also some of them have the same problem. How do you know when what you're seeing is an actual event that's going to happen in your dominant timeline or is just something you're going to experience and when you're seeing it as a precog, you don't know whether it's a, a real event you're going to see or just you in the future going to the that's movie right. seeing a scene. Mm-hmm. So, you know, years and years and years of study and all the work that I do, the theory that I'm floating, okay, still working on, is that let's say you're having a dream or let's say I see what's going to happen on 9-11 and I have the dream on 9-10, okay? Mm-hmm. I happen to know that a number of people around the world had precogs about 9-11 in different ways, shapes, and forms. I collected them. Most of them you've never heard of, but they did happen and I received them prior to, Okay. So what, what is going on there? Well, what I'm floating is that because the dreaming brain is interfacing with the core matrix and all these other coexisting timelines, that we are accessing other coexisting timelines. We're not going into the future. We're not going into the past. But um, there's something called a time slip that happens with the time shift, and that is that these various frequencies of coexisting timelines aren't actually lined up time-wise. It's not um, 1251 or 851, gotcha. you know. No, I, I, I'm, I, th- I think I'm clear on what you're talking about. You're saying that we get a glimpse of another timeline that is not uh, in a linear time right. w- with us now. Right. In That's this how timeline. Time yeah, I, I've got you. I've got you. That right. Could be. Right. So... So what may seem to be a future event from where we're dreaming from is actually Mm -hmm. something that's happening at that moment in that coexisting timeline. Right. Okay? Right. And and, and then some of us, some of us, I'm one of the us's, uh, are able to tell the difference between, you know, just a dream that's just jumbled events going on and something that I'm saying, that's going to happen. That's going to happen. And... I know the difference, so I type it up, I post it on the Internet, and I create documentation. Okay, well, I'm, I'm interested, and I'm sure many others are as well. How do you delineate between something that you've dreamt or um, yeah. whatever? How, how do you know it's something that's really going to happen versus the movie you'll see tomorrow? How do you right. know? What kind of stamp can I'll you put you on it to know? Now, this is personal to me. Because my interdimension research list, it really delves into this. Many people on my list are, have precogs. And every single person has a slightly different way that they can tell the, the difference. But here's how I do it. And I think it's pretty general. 
When I have what I know is a precog, that's one of those dreams that's like a lucid dream. It's like I am there. It is so real, so crisp, and it's not, and it seems to be like in a movie, the scenes make sense. Um, I, I also have the ability to have discussions within the dream of what's going on. So I'm very cohesive, very aware, very conscious, and sometimes I even know I'm, I'm dreaming. And there's somebody else there, and I'll be saying, oh, I'm looking at something that's going to happen. I better remember this. And then sometimes I can even ask questions or I can consciously take a look and see if I can see street signs, um, you know, so that I can locate where this event, because what I want to try to do is if I'm seeing a disaster, I want to try to prevent it. Mm-hmm. You know. Well, uh, I guess that would be a reality shift manifestation, preventing it. Um, but in the meantime, a great way to get some credibility is to immediately, with the ones you're sure of, uh, post them on the internet or post them someplace where it can all be documented and everybody can say, oh my God, look, she thought something would happen on 9-11 and it happened. And if you do enough of those and you're right enough at the time, you gain credibility. Right. All you need to do is to go to my website and you'll see a sampling of them. You can come onto my interdimension list where they are archived, a uh, date and time stamped and archived. And it's not just myself. There are other people as well on my list who have similar capabilities, and we do work together trying to figure out how to utilize this 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 gift to to help uh, people and help uh, humanity. So um, yes, uh, and I, I've created a criteria to to determine when something actually is a precog and is not a precog. For example, if somebody just has a dream about a plane crash and it's very generic, well, you know what? Planes crash all the time. Mm-hmm. They, you know, so so e- eventually a plane's going to crash, unfortunately, and then that person's going to say, I dream that. Oh, not so fast. <laughs> if you want to get into where I consider it documented, you have to have something very, very specific about that plane crash something very, very specific. And when you read my documented ones, you'll see what I'm talking about. I'm very, very specific about it. And then those plane crashes, they have to happen very immediately, you know, not months later, unless it's so specific that months later is acceptable. If there's something so different, so detailed, people's names, what they look like, the place where it crashed, those are the things that are useful precogs. Other than that, Please don't call it in my presence a precog because my criteria mm, well, the, the will ones not. Where, yeah, the ones that I'm interested in would be the ones where, for example, you're scheduled for a flight. You have uh, a precognitive uh, a dream or whatever that says this plane is going to crash. So you cancel your flight and then document the fact that you think this is going to happen and then it happens. Well, that's pretty solid stuff. Not conclusive, but pretty solid. What are the odds? Uh, We're going to take a break here, and then we're going to open the phone lines when we come back. I'm Art Bell for George Norrie from Manila, Philippines. Indeed so. Here I am from all the way over there. My guest is Starfire Tor, and I've been kind of reflecting and listening very carefully to what she's been saying. Now, I get you know, computer messages, fast blasts, as I do the program. And a lot of people think that she is uh, crazy as a loon. I'm not one of them. I, I really don't. I'm not in that camp at all. I don't think she's crazy as a loon. What I think is that she has discovered a lot of things that we've been talking about for years and has given her own interpretation to them. And fair enough, she's been doing this for years um, strange that I haven't run into her previously, but she's been doing it for years. She's known Whitley apparently for years. So all of this is new to me. Um, the things she's talking about are not new to me, whether it would be uh, time slips, the possibility of parallel universes, reality shift manifestation is what she calls it. I call it intention or focusing intention or consciousness experiments. But these are all these are all similar things. So, uh, you know, crazy? No, absolutely not. Um, discovering, perhaps, feeling that she's discovered things that have existed since 
probably time began, talked about when time began, um, and given her own interpretation to them. That's what I think we're dealing with here. At any rate, I'd love to take calls. I know that a lot of you have had the experiences that she's that we've been talking about this night, and I'd love to hear about them. And uh, for those of you who don't believe any of this, there will be uh, nothing that we can say that will convince you. For those who have experienced it, there will be nothing that will uh, um, change your mind. Uh, You already know it is so. And with that in mind, we'll go to an hour of calls in a moment. Well, all right, once again, Starfire Tower. Uh, Welcome back to the program. We're going to go to call Starfire and... uh, and, and see what people have to say about all of this. As I mentioned, we get, you know, a lot of computer messages as we're doing the program. And there are a lot of people who think it sounds all like New Age gibberish. And it may be in the uh, in the nature of the presentation. I'm not sure. But um, that's what they think it sounds like, some of them anyway. And th- there are others, uh, myself included, who think that you're totally on to something in all of these different areas. And we're just sort of looking at it in different ways. But it's the same it's the same thing indeed. So uh, if you're ready, we'll go to calls. How about that? I'm ready. Okay. Um, here we go. Let's go to, um, I think Houston, Texas brings us John. And uh, John, you're on the air with Starfire. Hi. Thank you. I've got three incidences. One has to do with uh, with uh, an after, after wedding reception. Okay. I, I've never caught a garter because uh, I'm blind, or just nearly so. I was I was nearly blinded anyway. Uh, I imagined how I wanted the garter to to arc through the air uh, mm-hmm. and, and glance off a guy's shoulder and into a, a cup that I was holding halfway. <laughs> yes. And uh, I said, you know, I, can't, I don't want, want, want to try to make this happen. I'll just let it happen. Mm-hmm. But I, but I did this imagination exercise three times, and it came away from the guy's hand, came across in a shallow arc, hit the guy's arm, and right over into the cup that I was holding. And uh, that's uh, I haven't ever told the uh, the people at the wedding about this, so I don't think they're listening tonight. It's way past their bedtime. No, that's a big wow because they'd think you're out of your mind. The other, yeah, that's probably what she'll think too. Uh, the other deal was uh, I was listening to uh, records that have thunderstorm uh, background music, and uh, people died. Uh, a woman came down in a parking garage and the uh, war filled up with water because the, uh, the, the because of the flooding. Uh, and uh, I had been imagining that it would not bother the, my father's house nor. Uh, the area of the uh, town that I was in. Uh, so I'm wondering, I'm thinking responsibility, where where you're given some kind of gift, you're responsible for it. And I was wondering uh, what uh, she might think of, uh, of an instance like I've been talking about. Okay, well, uh, I'm going to key on the word responsibility. Starfire, when we were doing all of these experiments years ago with the weather, um, it finally got to the point where I got cold feet. I actually got scared because I realized that I was, with the aid of millions of people, attempting to uh, manipulate a complex system like the weather that I didn't understand properly in the first place. And so I got concerned that, uh, oh, for example, we might try to alter the course of a hurricane that was due to hit the coast. And we might make a horrible mistake For example, we might move the hurricane away from its original area and what had been a Category 1 now goes back out into the Gulf and uh, finds warm water and grows and becomes a Category 4 or 5 or something and then hits. In other words, I, I had such little understanding of the mechanism driving this that I realized we could make a horrible mistake and I stopped doing it. Have you had any concerns like that with what you call reality shift manifestation? Yes, in fact, I had the exact fear that you had uh, when I first created a change in weather. Um, I, I just wasn't thorough enough, and instead I created a tornado. Uh, fortunately, it didn't hit land, but it did disrupt a regatta, I think, in Australia. Um, 
it, it scared me a, a lot. And I stopped doing that for a while until I did more research, put more into it, put more integrity behind it, and limited what I was doing to a certain type of weather modification. Um, even when I did the wildfires in California, I was so concerned that I might create mud flows. You know, that doesn't matter if somebody dies from a fire or a mud flow, you know. So, yes, fear. Art, I'm right with you there. So I'm right. very respectful of it, and I very sparingly do weather modification. I do not, and I have not in years, touched a hurricane okay. because of fear. All right. Uh, Howard, from my home state in Nevada, you're on the air with Starfire. Good morning. Oh, is this, uh, is this me, Howard? Uh, yes, it is. Oh, Art, Only you know that for sure, but it's like you, yes. Yeah, Howard Beale calling Art. Uh, uh, super cool. Uh, one of my goals is, is accomplished. I used to be a dumb old farm boy in the Pacific Northwest when you were like an independent uh, doing your political stuff, and uh, I would catch you on the skip. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, so I, I get to talk to Art Bell. Anyway, um, to Starfire, um uh, uh, my question was, if if you would uh, uh, try to shift time at this very, very moment, um, uh, uh, tell me uh, what would you what, what would uh, what would you like to do? We can do it now. Um, actually, okay. um, human beings, people, even with great intent, cannot create time shifts. That's not within the program. You can create localized reality shifts for yourself, but not time shifts so can't help you there so time shifts are something that uh we don't understand sufficiently yet to control in any way i I don't know of anybody who has ever claimed uh i wouldn't control the time shift they just happen i'm I'm very talented with reality shifts and even i wouldn't claim a time shift i'm not even sure that we would have the capability i'm not sure that we have what it takes to do that they that may be a you know a uh, a protection that's built into the program, possibly, but I don't know. I haven't gotten to that end of the road yet. Mm-hmm. Okay, I don't know is a good answer. David in uh, Victoria, British Columbia, how you doing, David? Oh, I'm doing great. Thanks, it's an honor, Art and Starfire. It's a dynamic duo you got going there. Um, I wanted to relate a, a what I thought for years was a precognitive dream. I only remembered this a few years ago, but it was like fifty five. Sort of been forty years, forty five years ago when I was ten. And I had a really super lucid dream about, I even saw myself walking into PJs down a path by the house. And I was taken to this, like, sort of a chrome, big, giant pill. It was like a ship or some sort. And I was shown these screens. I got a little awareness of a being that was like a cocoon, sort of, from the movie guy, like, glowy guy. But this was way before the movie came out. <laughs> anyway, he showed me these screens where there were these, like, urban warfare and it seemed to be like in North America and tanks rolling through cities and mm-hmm. mummies screaming, clutching their babies and stuff, just horrible mm-hmm. stuff. And for, I thought it was, well, was that precognitive? Oh no, oh no. Uh, okay. But well, I had, I know now, I don't really think it was precognitive at all. I think I was being sort of gauged or tested of what would my emotional reaction well, you know, any time that I hear somebody say something like that, I, I, I have a criteria. So the first thing I want to know is, oh, were you watching a movie? Were you reading something? What, what were you personally exposed to? Could be a dream. It could be something stimulated from what you were exposed to. Then the other thing I want to ask you is, um, have you ever had actual precogs where you dream something and then, wham, it happened? Because that tells a lot. People don't have singular precogs. Unfortunately, he's off the line. But, uh, you know, what he said about being shown screens uh, calls to mind uh, Gordon Michael Scallion. I don't, I, do you know his that name? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Gordon Michael um, had similar experiences. He was shown uh, when he has his visions or precognitive experiences, he's shown several screens. Right. Uh, and, and finally, uh, the, the experience will reoccur and reoccur. Finally, one of the screens... The only way he can describe it is it will it will be brilliant, it will be in color, and it will be very vivid. While the other screens, uh, through these experiences, slowly sort of fade to black and white, if you will. So the one 
that becomes vivid is the one that is going to become the reality. At least that's the way he explained it. Well, that sounds great. And and that would be completely specific to him. And it sounds beautiful. And um, and I have no problem with it. And if this uh, if if David um, is having something similar to that and he has not been exposed to scallion screens, uh, then that would be very interesting. But beyond that. Uh, I don't know what to do with the information. I'd say write it up and any other things like that you've ever had and see if there's a pattern. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, To Michael in Cleveland, Ohio. Good morning, Michael. Good evening, Art and Starfire. Hi. Hi. Art, in waiting for a mechanism, describing alternative shifting timelines seems as subjective as me describing a DMT experience. So, Starfire, my two-part question is, please, can you explain at the level of the synapse gap in the brain how dreaming accesses other shifting reality timelines? It would seem that verification that's causal and not descriptive is where any core understanding lies. Okay. um, uh, You're kind of... Mixing up a little the science there, you're talking about the dreaming brain, you're talking about synapses in the brain, but the dreaming brain does not shift time, okay? The dreaming brain is accessing information that is like streaming data, just like you're picking up streaming data off your computer. So me saying that, could you please reframe your question based on that? I have specific how dreaming accesses other shifting reality timelines at the level of the synapse in the brain. The actual mechanism that would allow us to have that experience, which would be a cause, and not just the descriptive effects that you have been describing. Right. Okay. Um, you're, you're talking about accessing, I'm just going to call it coexisting timelines or, or that data. Um, The dreaming brain, you know, scientists, even to this day, cannot really tell you the source of the dreaming brain. They know what parts of the brain become active. They know that the the brain is firing off. They know the synapses, the neurons and all that are firing off, but they don't understand why. And the most that we get from them is that it's psychological, that it's some retread of either the day that we've had or our brain is putting together scenes that reflect our psychological state. Okay, he's asking how the brain accesses right. these other timelines. Right. So the, the brain itself is a biological machine that, has it, that is in itself, as a biological entity, is an interface. It was created to be an interface and a projector for the core matrix. So the brain functions, whatever fires off, fires off. The brain so, itself is the machine. It's a biological machine. So whatever the internal workings of the, um, of, of the brain are firing off, it creates imagery. That's not a mystery. But where the, imagery, where the imagery comes from, that's what's been the mystery. So I'm suggesting, because of my research, that this is the brain with, with the body quieted, and not having to deal with the five senses, the brain is now freer to pick up this data. It's like raw data, raw streaming data. Okay, that's all fair enough. But uh, really what you're saying is you don't know how it specifically does that. Well, I mean, it's what any scientist, I mean, I do. But I, I can't, I mean, if I started to speak the language of the science, I think I would make mistakes just off the top of my head. And I don't want to scientifically make a mistake. So I'm just referring him to the various sciences that are known now of how the brain functions when the images are in the brain. That, that biology still is true to what I'm saying. It's the origin of the images that I'm talking about. Okay. All right. Ed in Allentown, Pennsylvania. You're on the air with Starfire. Hi. Good morning, Art. Good morning. Rare, rare pleasure and uh uh, really happy to speak to both you and to Starfire. Um, I was wondering if Starfire, if you had ever 
uh, come across anybody who had lack of oxygen, um, like a you know medical condition that caused them to you know see precognitively and or tap into other universes. I had an experience in 2001 mm -hmm. in which, and and I did have a precog the morning of. 9-11, right, getting ready for work at 4 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. I was a very busy person. And actually part of my question and comment was about Gordon Michael Scallion because when I was in the hospital, I was having similar experiences to him. And then Art mentioned Gordon Michael. Um, the thing was my oxygen levels had resulted from 20-plus years of chronic sleep apnea untreated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And by the time I made it to the hospital, I was like collapsing. Okay, and actually, we, we, we call it, we can make this a, a, a sort of a double question. One regarding, say, oxygen deprivation for a period of time causing, causing you to, to see something or um, have a precognitive experience. Or we can talk about drugs uh, and ask Starfire uh, if either one of these mind altering experiences will enhance your ability uh, to, to, to have a precognitive uh, experience. Um, Ed, um, first of all, I'm sorry about your sleep apnea. I hope that you've improved since then. Um, I'm just going to say that some um, lack of oxygen hallucinations, uh, including some near-death experience hallucinations, which are the same, some of them are just images that are in the brain that are rolling around that are being accessed. Others are being um, accessed through the interface. I have no way of knowing, no way whatsoever of knowing what you are accessing without really taking down exactly what you perceived and seeing whether it's something that can be tracked down into your waking world or whether it just remained within your brain as an experience. All right. We've got to... Pause here. We're at a break point. And I, when we get back, I'm going to ask again about drugs, whether drugs are, in fact, a doorway to experiences that uh, you might not otherwise have. Do they open doors or do they slam them shut? Here I am. And indeed, from Manila, Philippines, the other side of the world, from the great majority of you, it's great to be here and it's great to be alive. My guest is Starfire Tour. And, um, I've got a number of questions for her, one about drugs and then one from Dave in Fort Myers, Florida. All of that directly ahead. We'll be right back. Starfire, the most uh, compelling piece of evidence that you presented tonight, in my opinion, I'm sure many others, was the Circuit City building and the incident that dates back to, what, June 29th, 2001, right? Correct. Um, Dave in Fort Myers, Florida, fast blast the following. Art, it's hard to believe someone... When they say they had video proof of an event now for eight years, but they don't want to release it to the public. And that's, you know, it's a fair, it's fair comment. Well, um, actually, Dave, I've had very similar evidence that goes back farther than that. My interest is the research and to get it right and to not just to go to the public and, uh, and say, oh, look what I found. Oh, look what I have. That's, but, that's, but that is what you're doing. Well, not, at this moment, at some right. point in time, but I've been around right. for a very long time. Right. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not selling anything. I'm just sharing my research at this time because I just feel the time is right. Um, and I will be coming out with this information, but I'm not directing you to a video or a book or anything else. It's not there for you to buy. I understand. Um, I'm sharing this because I think that people have gotten to a point where uh, a good number of people can actually um, begin to think about what I'm talking about. If I can get a dialogue going, if I can get people to think about it, even what I've said about intention, what about peace prayers and war? If I can just mm -hmm. get people to think about that, think about it, um, the rest will come. Now, you were asking about drugs. That's right. Uh, drugs and, like, for example, DMT and, and other similar drugs that yeah. produce... Yeah. Uh, very big mind-altering events. Do you think right. there are keys to these uh, uh, these other realities? Okay. These um, I, well, okay. Personally, I want to say that I personally do not 
drink alcohol, and I do not take mind-altering drugs. Okay. Um, that's a personal choice. Um, mm-hmm. I don't want anything to corrupt what I already have going. I respect my brain very much. Now, I know that drugs, mind-altering drugs, have been around since the ancient times and have been used um, at, by natives and drug culture. Um, I'm very mixed bag about this because I've seen, like everyone else has, how much damage to the brain that has been done to people who have gone on trips, gone on drug trips. So right now, I'm going to say that on, unless such a drug adventure were done under the strictest of scientific control, mm-hmm. where it would be guaranteed that that person's brain was not fried or altered in a negative way, I'd say stay away from it. Otherwise, I'm sure well, I'm sure that's good advice. That's that standard thing. advice. But again, the question was, do you think that drugs, mind-altering drugs, could be um, an, an open door to these kinds of um, experiences? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. All right. Let's go uh, to Columbus, Ohio, where we find Chris. Uh, good morning, Chris. How are you? Uh, yes, I've listened to you for many years, Art. Uh, one of the things I want to mention about the elect- electromagnetic field is that we got to go back to the Philadelphia experiment, Alex Beale, how they created that. Has she considered the timeline was broken at that time, which may have brought the Circuit City building up and back, and that might be something to do with the uh, timeline shift. This is a person, Alex Beale, with the Philadelphia experiment. They did claim that he created a time bubble, which might be affecting what she has experienced. Has she ever looked in that research or gone that way or even looked at the lecture? Right. I, I guess actually the question is, um, do you think that something like, um, well, the Philadelphia experiment was uh, uh, an interesting story. Al Bielik, uh told it. There are others who have told it. It was uh, an electromagnetic uh, experiment to make a ship disappear. I'm sure you know all about it. Uh, so could some of these things that you have described, these reality shift manifestations perhaps, be um, produced by some sort of machine and electromagnetic field? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint, Chris, but it is my opinion that the Philadelphia experiment never happened. That okay. was a hoax. Um, I'm not saying that electromagnetic testings of something else weren't done, but the Philadelphia experience, no. And it should not be used um, to, to explore time travel. Uh, anyone who has latched into the Philadelphia experiment would simply, in my opinion, uh, be a caution. So I'm sorry, but I can't discuss the Philadelphia experiment as if it's something that was real when I don't believe it was. Good and enough. by the way, the ship, the Eldridge, mm-hmm. research indicates that it was sold to, I think, Greece. Um, I followed all the numbers, as have a few other researchers like myself. And let me tell you something, re- reality here. Uh, the government would not have let go of, of anything like a ship or even pieces of a ship to a foreign country if, if it were involved in such an outstanding oh, yeah. um, cutting edge right. research like that. You know, that's part of the way that I that I I, I, I I agree with you. And I think Anthony in Arizona does, too. I heard him saying, oh, yeah, in the background. He's he's mm-hmm. with us now. Anthony, hello. Yes. Uh, how are you doing, Mr. Bell? I'm doing OK. Yeah. Hi, stuff. How are you? Oh, hi. I, I love your show, uh, Mr. Bell. I've been listening over 12 years. Thank you. You're a definite impact in my life. And I hope. Nobody goes anywhere. In fact, the show's replaced in place of my TV, so I don't even watch TV anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a couple of things I just want to bring up, again, with the Circus City situation. Okay. Sure. And other examples as such. I was just wondering, how would you pinpoint or get an idea of the locations these, thing may, these things may occur? Oh, that, that's a very good question, uh... Mm-hmm. Okay, well, um, years and years and years of research, and I noticed that that a lot of the time anomalies that I was uh, finding were where earthquakes were, earthquake fault lines. And so basically, I just got a map, and I started to follow earthquake fault lines. Hmm. 
<laughs> and so I do a lot of my research around or on earthquake fault. And the Circuit City building is right by an earthquake fault. So that that's actually, is, that's, yeah, it's very intriguing. Um, do you know that there are electromagnetic anomalies associated with tectonic movement? Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. So yeah. that sort earthquake, of blasts us um, back to the last the question. The energy, sure. Mm-hmm. All so, right. So, um, off, we're so short on time. Tracy in uh, South Carolina. Hi, you're on with Starfire and Art Bell. Uh, Art, I just want to say that I've been a long time listener. It's the first time I've ever managed to get through though. Uh, I have a, a comment and a question. The comment concerns what I think might be an example of what Starfire is referred to as a temporal anomaly mm-hmm. that happened locally in my town. Uh, we were, I, I drive a taxi at night, so I listen to you all the time. Mm-hmm. We were really slow and we were listening to the scanner. And there was a shooting that occurred at the, uh, at the uh, local Waffle House. There are multiple witnesses, people inside the restaurant. It happened in the parking lot. The mm-hmm. ladies that worked there, the, all the cab drivers here, heard it over the scanner. And uh, we drove by and saw the police and, you know, the whole, whole thing. Right. Well, it never made the news, it never made the TV, never made the papers. So I got to asking about it, and all the people who were witnesses to it remembered it. But apparently it never happened now. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what you've shot, been talking about. Right. Yeah, the that's... guy who was shot and killed, was, was he's alive now. And the guy who shot him and killed him is out walking around free. Well, if that isn't right down the alley of, of what you've been saying, Starfire. Exactly. That's a time shift living dead event, and that's a dual timeline memory conflict. Perfect. That happens to people everywhere all the time. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, thank you indeed. Um, all right, to uh, the District of Columbia and Matt. Good morning, Matt. Yes, sir, Art Bell. And, uh, ma'am, great hearing you tonight. Art, I discovered you in 96 driving cross-country at night through the desert, and it was amazing. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, back then and still today. Um, definitely want to support your 9-11 precognition uh, situation. I was living, sleeping, dreaming, uh, working in a building just north of Building 7 uh, back then and also living on Lower East Side of New York. And in July, walking down the street, I looked up and would swear I saw both towers on fire. I ran screaming down the street, ran, grabbed my roommates, pulled them upstairs to the roof, screaming how the World Trade Center was on fire, and they were eventually call me down to say, no, no, it's clouds. Huh. And then over the next two months, I had a series of all kinds of signs from uh, having lunch there at, on the plaza of the World Trade Center the day before. I made the comment that it looked like an, uh, a cemetery in Israel with a stone, uh, two stones and one on top. Uh, and eventually that morning on 9-11, I flew cross-country out of Newark Airport on a wide-body jet. In my case, to San Diego. So I sort of was pulled closer and closer until finally when it actually happened. Um, well, that's a long story, but make a long story short. Um, definitely support you there, but I want to challenge you on the concept of peace prayers and mantras. I think it was in 86 when the harmonic convergence, the sort of first concept of world peace prayer had gone on. Am I correct? I, I don't remember the exact date, but... Well, I believe it was 86, and 89 is when, you know, frankly, the Soviet Union, um, the Iron Cur- Curtain came down, and having studied that in college, if mm. anything, the, you know, thousands of nuclear, you know, at the moment's notice, hair-trigger nukes that I'm not saying we're in a safer time with the loose nukes, but we're certainly back down away from that, and so I think there's possible linkage there. And in terms of focus and tension, I definitely had personal su- success with creative visualization, super high-end, you know, exact matching numbers, dollar amounts, things wished for, and so on. And the only explanation of all the psychic phenomena I've experienced, lifetime, all sorts of different things, is that quantum level that I don't think I've heard you guys talk about tonight, um, where, you know, the holographic universe concept, where every electron is ultimately entangled at a subatomic level, thus allowing for, you know, everything from precognitive through all the other sorts of phenomena that i actually, actually- about. Or we opened the show with that. So um, we did talk about it. Whitley made any number of comments about that. And I think it all is entangled. If it's you know. all entangled. <laughs> all entangled. All right. Uh, he made a good point, though, didn't he, about uh, – you remember that? Yes, he, he, he talked about the harmonic convergence and the wall coming down in that as yeah. a peace prayer. Mm-hmm. Um, um, if, if you could prove 
that there was a direct, you know, relation between a peace prayer for intent to to actually bring down that wall, then you have something there. But otherwise, we're still left with the larger the larger picture of millions and millions of people over time doing peace prayers, and we're still a planet at war, very violent, more violent than ever before. So that's what I'm saying. The energy has to go somewhere. Where is it going? That's all I want people to think about. It's an amazing thing. Once you're- I'm, not, I'm not sure, Starfire, that it's, it's legit to say more violent than ever before. It's not more violent than the First World War, the Second World War, the Korean War, Vietnam for that matter. Um, we have terrorism, but if you're if you're looking at scales and numbers, uh, indeed the world is a more peaceful place than it was for our fathers. Hmm. Really? Give it some, give it some thought. Uh, oh, absolutely. I mean, just sheer numbers alone, the number of people uh, killed in the in the Great World Wars, uh, and even the somewhat lesser but still violent wars that occurred in our lifetimes. Um, I think that I think that's a fair comment. Um, let's, let's move on though. We're so short on time. Too bad. Um, Montreal, Canada brings Sophie. Sophie, you're on the air. Good morning. Hi. Hi, Art. Hi, Starfire. It's an honor to speak to the two of you. Hi. I just finished reading Robert A. Damon Rowe, and it was a real... You're cutting out on us. Are you on a... Yeah. Are you on a cell phone or something? You're cutting out. No, unfortunately, I'm on Skype. Um, oh. I just want some tips and tricks on having out of body experience my body when I'm having an out of body experience. Okay. Um, I don't know how into out of body experiences you are, Starfire. It's a um, whole I actually separate... teach it. So you, teach it. you just okay. go to my interdimension list and join. I'll give you everything. It's totally free. Okay. Uh, while we're on the subject, what is uh, what is your where do you recommend people go? You mentioned. Uh, your Facebook page? Um, if they go to my uh, www.starfiretour.com, you'll see the links to uh, my interdimension list, my profile on Facebook, and MySpace and Twitter. Um, have fun. And if you want to get into learning and sharing your experiences, join my interdimension list. If you want to just experience what's going on at just a more public level, join my Facebook. And okay. um and you can check out everything I'm talking about, all the documented stuff. All right. Re in Salt Lake City. You're on the air with Art Bell and Starfire. Hi. Hi, Art. I really, really miss you. There's no one like you, but I'm glad you're happy. Thank you. To Starfire, um, I'm afraid that I'm going to have to challenge you a little. Sure. Um, I'm not trying to be mean or anything, but you're, you know, you're a little, I think you're a little condescending and a little full of yourself. But one thing that was brought up in the beginning was that you were going to prove how um, the timeline shifts, explain the paranormal and other other anomalies. And I, I didn't even hear that all night. So I was wondering if you could touch on that in the three minutes that are left. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, um, you know, if I'm uh, full of myself, well, shame on me. Um uh, I thought that I had touched on certain examples of, of time shifts. One of them is the time shift living dead. Uh, were you listening during the show when I was discussing that? Hopefully she was. Good, because uh, that is one of the examples that, that people can realize all on their own that a time shift has happened. Another thing are synchronicities and coincidences and time prompts that people experience all the time, my, my research is indicating that these items are also the brain being very aware of changes in the timeline, and these prompts and coincidences are what's left over to try to ping the brain and get the brain to uh, try to recognize that something in their reality has changed. So uh, those are ways that people themselves can uh, get into a dialogue about it, uh, synchronicities, coincidences, and time prompts. And, in fact, the 1111 time prompt is one of them. I want to point out to people that computers have a language, that language is ones and zeros. It's very possible that the very famous 1111 time prompt is simply saying the core matrix exists. Pay attention. That's one level, just a suggestion to think about. 
Okay. Actually, that that is worth a little bit of thought. Yes. Uh, where do you go from here, Starfire? Um, are you going to write a book? I am. I, I am writing a book um, on reality shift manifestation, uh, which will explain, of course, about the core matrix and coexisting timelines and time shifts. And I want to try to give people um, the methodology of reality shift manifestation, actual documented examples. I'm getting permissions from the people over the years that I've worked with. Uh, just to try to give some hope, and I think they'll find that it fits in very nicely with um, the other intentions that they've been working on. And like I said, to get a dialogue going, that's one of the things I'm doing. How does Starfire earn a living? Um, I have, um, um, I'm in the entertainment industry. I have a production company. Okay. Um, that's, and I also am a consultant with a lot of other companies. Mark. I under I understand. Very, very interesting. And I, I don't know how you've been going all these years and we've not previously connected. It's By a, art, it must be a time shift. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it is a good example of a time shift. Time. I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, listen, uh, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the program. Um, not everybody understands your presentation or method of presentation, but I certainly understand uh, the things that you've been working on and they're very much like an awful lot of things we've worked on on this program. So it's, it's a good fit. Starfire, thank you very, very much. Thank you. And uh, have a very good night. I'm sure we'll do this again one day. And again, yes, very, very interesting. Uh, you know, people react in interesting ways to somebody's presentation. They like, they don't like, but the actual substance, the material that she's talking about, resonates with so much of what we've been doing over the years. And... I guess that's it for this night. We're out of time. So given another opportunity, one of these days, you'll hear me back here again. From Manila, Philippines, I'm Art Bell. Night all.